Marked by an assassin, Eternal Mate's Paranormal Romance Series, Book 8, written by Felicity Heaton, narrated by Eric G. Dove. Chapter 10 Harbin was sure he was about to make the biggest mistake of his life yet. He stared at the black steel door of the closed nightclub, his heart thundering against his ribs slowly building up the courage to knock on the damn thing and accept whatever fate awaited him. Whatever happened once that door opened, it was going to be tough to handle, and he wasn't sure he was ready. He wasn't sure he would ever be ready. He had spent the time it had taken to locate the nightclub and then the long walk to it, mauling over everything and gathering the balls to go through with the plan. But now he was here, that strength had fled him and he wanted to forget it and find somewhere else to lay low and discuss everything he had discovered about his mark. The two elves staring at him as if he had gone mad propelled him into action when they both stepped forwards, their armor peeling back from their hands in unison as they raised them to knock. He growled at both of them and they glared at him, but relented when he blew out his breath and approached the door. He could do this. How bad could it be? Images of his older brother killing him sprang to mind. Or worse, Kavanaugh looking bitterly disappointed to see him again. His hand fell, his stomach dropping with it. He couldn't do it. It had been too long and Kavanaugh probably blamed him for everything that had happened and hated his guts, and he wouldn't blame his brother one bit. But he didn't think he could take seeing the anger and resentment in his brother's eyes. Not again. For the love of God! Hart grabbed him before he could move a muscle and darkness swallowed them. When it evaporated, all three of them were standing in the middle of the closed nightclub with several fey and some mortals staring at them. A slender mortal female near the long black bar that lined the wall opposite him turned towards him, her blonde hair swaying across her shoulders as she shifted and pinned him with large dark eyes. His own eyes widened when he saw beyond her catching sight of the unconscious blue-haired male laid out on the bar top, the colored lights rotating above him, washing him with somber hues. Loki. Harbin looked back at the female. Was this the one who had betrayed Loki? He would have growled at her had the male standing beside her not been staring at him so intently, radiating familiar power that had him carefully considering any move he made. The one who had commanded heart and fury to halt their attack another elf. The male's violet eyes glimmered with keen intelligence, and his blue-black hair was preened and perfect, neatly clipped at the sides and back, revealing his pointed ears. Black-scaled armor hugged a lithe physique that belied the power this male held within his grasp. It wasn't only physical power. He radiated power of another nature, his regal bearing and confidence speaking of a male who commanded respect and seemed to have it from all those around him, a mortal female, a jaguar shifter, an archangel huntress, and a demon king. Even Harbin's two elf companions seemed at a loss and unable to bring themselves to look at the male, which led Harbin to suspect he was some sort of leader of their kind. The elf's pure violet gaze darkened, and the hand he held against the blonde female's neck tensed. Ignore them. Thorn and Sable will deal with them. That didn't sound good. The blonde female nodded and returned her focus to Loki, and the black-haired archangel Huntress and her burly, russet-haired, bare-chested companion advanced on him. The big demon grunted, his red eyes glowing like embers as he rolled his thickly muscled shoulders, and his dusky horns began to curl from behind his pointed ears. The Huntress Harbin might be able to handle, but the demon was going to prove a problem, especially since he had the sinking feeling the pair were bonded. If Harbin tried to take out the Huntress, the demon would lose his shit, and an enraged demon was far too powerful for him to take down, even with two elves on his side. A door to the left of the black bar shot open, and Harbin's breath rushed from his lungs as his gaze shot towards it and landed on another tall male clad in just a pair of pale gray sweats. Fuck. Maybe letting the demon kill him wasn't such a bad idea after all. The new male's silver eyes verged on wild, his equally silver short hair mussed on top, 
as if he had been sleeping just seconds before. Just seconds before he had smelled Harbin in the club. The male stormed toward him and Harbin struggled to breathe, fighting to settle his heart and his nerves, and find a sliver of strength and courage to face the male who was looking at him as if he was staring at a ghost, but was throwing off dangerous vibes that had Harbin's animal side prowling and ready to push for freedom and attack. The big snow leopard male was pissed as all hell, and Harbin could hardly blame him. But at odds with the anger rolling off him in tangible waves was something that gave Harbin the courage and hope he needed. Incredulity filled the male's pale eyes. The sandy-haired jaguar shifter moved into the path of sable and thorn and folded his arms across his chest, causing the dark gray t-shirt he wore with his paler gray sweats to tighten across his back. I have a no-fighting policy in this club, as you're well aware, at least until I know what the fuck they want. Sable's golden eyes darkened, and Harbin had the impression she wanted to ignore the shifter and attack them anyway. She looked like the type that loved to fight. Maybe the almighty train wreck that was about to hit him and spill the story of his life would provide enough entertainment for her and everyone else in the room. Harbin sucked down a breath and blew it out. Brother? Everyone turned to look at him, but the jaguar shifter's stunned expression won first prize. You know them, Cavanaugh? His brother nodded, his silver eyes locked on Harbin. I like to think I knew one of them anyway. It's been a while since we've seen each other. I might be wrong. Those words cut him, and he dropped his gaze to his bare feet, clenched his teeth, and tried to weather the hurt that welled up inside him. He cursed the softer part of him, the emotions the female had unleashed, breathing new life into them because they only caused him pain. They were the source of so much agony, and he had kept them contained, had locked them away to spare himself, and now he couldn't so much as breathe without feeling as if he was dying, each gulp of air scraping in his lungs. He sensed fury and heart flanking him, and silently thanked them for their support. Hart knew the story of his life, but fury didn't, and Harbin hadn't expected him to care enough about him to have his back although the mad bastard probably just wanted to fight everyone else in the room, and forming an offensive line with him and Hart was a good way of pushing someone into attacking first. Harbin lifted his head and looked back at Kavanaugh, and the low-lit club and everyone in it fell away as he stared into familiar silvery eyes, at a face that took him back to better times and only made the pain in his heart grow fiercer. Sable shouted something and Hart retaliated, but Harbin didn't pay them any attention as he looked at his brother, fighting to find the right words to say. He had been keeping track of Kavanaugh's movements over the years, using his network of contacts like spies to keep an eye on his older brother. It had surprised him when Kavanaugh had left the Pride and come to London, but it hadn't surprised him when he had learned that his brother had finally found his mate and brought her back to Underworld with him. He was glad for them in a small way, one he didn't want to acknowledge not when he knew that such an ending wasn't on the cards for him. It was rare for a snow leopard shifter to find their mate, and Kavanaugh's had been right in front of him from the start. Eloise. Harbin had always known his brother's feelings for the female, even when Kavanaugh had failed to see them for himself. It was about time the idiot noticed how mad he was for her, and how in love she was with him. Kavanaugh had a big heart, had always been the better male, and he deserved a happy ending. Himself, on the other hand, he only deserved the anger he could see building in his brother's eyes, as Kavanaugh came to terms with what he was seeing, and that it was really him standing in the middle of the closed nightclub, causing another fight to break out because trouble had always followed him everywhere. Kavanaugh continued to stare at him in silence, and Harbin wasn't sure how much more he could take. He hadn't seen him in two decades, and he wasn't exactly the brother that Kavanaugh remembered. He doubted that his older brother could see a single shred of the male he had once known in him now. Maybe he could change that at least, although the desire that ran through him would possibly just show Kavanaugh how much he had changed, because he couldn't remember ever apologizing for anything in the eighty years they had lived together in the mountains. But he needed to do it. He needed to tell his brother how sorry he was before Kavanaugh turned on him and hit him with both barrels. He opened his mouth and didn't have a chance to get the first word of his apology out. 
Kavanaugh grabbed him and Harbin tensed, prepared to take a blow. But then his brother's arms wrapped around him like steel bands, crushing him with the strength of his embrace. The warmth of his skin, the familiar scent of him, sent all of Harbin's strength flooding from him as he sank against Kavanaugh, feeling as if he was dreaming or had maybe finally lost his mind, because it felt too good to be real. Gods, I've been looking for you for five fucking years, you little bastard. Where the fuck have you been? Those words growled in his ear with so much anger and affection drained the last of Harbin's strength, and he couldn't find his voice to answer. He closed his eyes and hoped to the gods Hard and Fury were too busy arguing with Sable and Thorn about what had happened back at the Archangel facility to notice how pathetic he was acting, stripped of his strength by nothing more than a tight bear hug from his brother. The guild would laugh their arses off at him, and his reputation as a merciless assassin would be shot if word got out about this. The darker side of him said to push his brother away and remember what he was now. He was that merciless assassin with blood on his hands, but the softer part wanted to stay a little longer, absorbing what it felt like because he couldn't remember ever experiencing this. He felt wanted, loved, even when he knew he didn't deserve it. Kavanaugh cleared his throat, released him, and scrubbed a hand around the back of his neck. We should probably go somewhere private to talk. The awkward edge to his brother's pale eyes drew Harbin's focus back to the others in the room with them, and he barely stifled his cringe as he realized that Hart had witnessed the public display of affection. Thank the gods that Fury was too busy growling and flashing fangs at the demon king, practically nose to nose with the massive brute. The door in the back wall banged open again, throwing a brief burst of white light across the room. Hart? Silence descended as a soft female voice rose above the din, and the tension already filling the air grew thicker. Kavanaugh swung towards the source of the voice, shifting to one side of Harbin and revealing the female to him. Another elf. It was rare to see a female outside of the elf lands in hell, and even rarer to see one stand with her head tipped up, radiating confidence in the company of so many males. Strength. This was one female who knew how to handle herself, and the look in her violet eyes said she was considering dealing out some punishment to his boss for some reason. If Harbin had to guess, he would say they had a history, and that it hadn't ended well. The elf female stepped further into the room, her fall of black hair brushing her shoulders and melting into the long black satin negligee she wore. Harbin was about to look to Hart for an explanation, when all hell broke loose. The jaguar shifter roared, the strange sound echoing around the expansive nightclub, and launched himself at Hart. Harbin swiftly sidestepped out of the path of the male, moving closer to his brother and readying his own claws. The jaguar slammed into Hart, knocking him back a few steps, but his boss was quick to defend, blocking each fierce blow the sandy-haired male dealt. Hart teleported and appeared right in front of the female elf. Harbin cringed. Was his boss insane? Was he trying to get himself killed? It was obvious to Harbin that the jaguar was mated to the female elf, and he was fairly sure Hart knew it too. He was provoking the jaguar on purpose, but Harbin didn't have a damned clue why. The jaguar roared again, the sound deafening in the heavy silence, and sprang towards Hart, landing right behind the taller elf male, his eyes glowing dangerously in the low light. Hart ducked to his left, dodging the blow the jaguar aimed at the back of his head and twisted to face him. Hart actually smiled at his enemy. Maybe Fury wasn't the only mad bastard in the guild's ranks. How the hell do you know my mate? The jaguar snarled and slashed with his claws, frustration rolling off him as Hart dodged again, nimbly strafing to his left and coming around behind him. We were engaged once, Hart said and it explained a lot, and also made a whole messed up situation reach boiling point. Kaita! The female elf snapped in a firm tone, but her mate wasn't listening. Kaita roared and kicked off, hurling a hard right hook at Hart's face. Hart went to dodge to avoid it, and the jaguar moved with speed beyond what was possible for his species, catching the elf with a swift left that had him staggering sideways and growling. The noise level in the room rose as Hart finally stopped evading Kyder and attacked him, 
landing several blows but receiving just as many as he dealt as they danced around the room. Cavanaugh backed off and Harbin joined him, giving the two room to work out their differences. The bitter scent of anger and frustration rolled from the blonde mortal female at the bar with the elf leader, growing stronger as the room grew louder. Whatever she and the elf were doing to Loki, they were trying to help him, and the fight wasn't helping them concentrate. He looked back at Hard and Kiter as they grappled with each other, tempted to intervene and give the mortal female a shot at helping the dragon shifter. He could sense Loki weakening, and as heartless as he tried to be, he didn't want to see the male die. You must stop disappearing like this, my prince. A male dressed in the black armor of the elves appeared close to the one Harbin had pegged as some sort of leader of their species, and answered one of the questions that had been plaguing Harbin. The male was a prince. The prince. The prince's hand tensed against the back of the mortal female's neck, and she squawked. I am sorry. The new elf male huffed, but there was no anger in it, nor frustration. If anything, it sounded teasing to Harbin. Was this male a sort of babysitter for the prince? The two had to be close if the prince accepted the way he had spoken to him, chastising him in front of others in a manner that almost challenged his authority. The female in the negligee pinned him with wide violet eyes. Blue? The male looked over his shoulder at her, his wild blue-black hair parting to reveal the pointed tips of his ears as he brushed it back from his face. Lights flashed over that face, and Harbin recognized it. Not a babysitter, but a commander. Harbin had crossed paths with the elf in the past, and each encounter had left him with new scars. He smiled grimly. He had given as good as he had got, though, adding a few new scars to the male's collection. Elves weren't the only ones with weapons capable of cutting through their armor. Harbin's blades were made of the same material, a gift from Hart the day he had proven himself as a member of the guild by eradicating three powerful fey and protecting injured comrades. Blue frowned at the female, and then turned on the spot, his gaze swinging towards the source of the commotion. It landed on Harbin, a brief flicker of recognition lit his violet eyes, and then he shifted his focus to Kiter and Hart, where they fought in the center of the massive room. Harbin sidestepped again when Kiter went flying past him, stumbling but not managing to keep his footing. The sandy-haired male landed on his back on the black floor, pressed his hands to the ground above his shoulders, and flipped back onto his feet. Golden fur rippled in waves over his arms, and he flashed fangs as he growled at Hart, his eyes bright in the darkness. Hart was pushing his luck. If the male shifted, it would be difficult to defeat him. What did you do this time to get into deep shit with assassins, Eo? Blue barked, and the female elf looked mortified. I am not in trouble. She folded her arms across her chest and glared at Blue. Hart is not here because of me. Kyder landed a hard blow on Hart's jaw, and the elf staggered sideways and snarled at the jaguar through bloodied fangs. His boss was going to end up needing to see the dentist if things continued, and Harbin wasn't sure it would end there. Fury was prowling the sidelines of the fight, his claws flexing as he watched the two males go at it. The Archangel Huntress and her demon escort both looked as if they were considering joining in for the hell of it. But most worrying was the look slowly dawning in Blue's violet eyes, one that warned he was close to dealing with Hart himself. Harbin wasn't sure what would happen if Blue made a move, but pandemonium sprang to mind. It would be all-out war, as both sides took it as a cue to join the fight. Oh, that is enough! The female elf huffed and disappeared in a burst of green-purple light, reappearing right between Kyder and Hart, her long negligee swirling around her legs like black smoke. She pressed her delicate palm to Hart's armored chest, and he sailed across the room, slammed into the black wall to Harbin's right, and landed with a grunt on the floor. Kyder breathed hard beside her, each labored one shifting his gray t-shirt and causing the long claw marks in the soft material to open and reveal flashes of blood-stained skin. His bright golden eyes locked on Hart and then her. The dark abysses of his pupils widened, and Harbin could see the hunger in him. His own animal side rose in response to it, the primal needs that had seized hold of him back at the Archangel facility coming back full force to fill him with a maddening need to shift and track the female snow leopard. He needed her.
His chest heaved with that need, and he struggled to remain where he was, battling his body as the ache to shift grew stronger, and the voice deep within him commanded him to find the female. She was vulnerable and alone, left at the mercy of an organization that had done terrible things to her. He had left her there. He had left her behind. His brother's gaze landed on him, intense and focused, pulling his away from the exit. Kavanaugh's silver eyes questioned him, and he knew his brother could sense the struggle within him, and he knew the source of it. It was his impending transition into sexual maturity that was triggering the need to find the female and nothing more. Kavanaugh frowned at him, a flicker of something in his eyes that Harbin didn't like. It was nothing more. He looked away from his brother, unable to look at him when he was fighting the urge to hunt for the female. Gods, he wanted to hunt her. He wanted her. The compelling need ran deeper in his blood than the usual urge to fight and fuck, and no matter how much he wanted to pretend it was otherwise, he knew it stemmed from more than hormones. This need ran soul deep. Kavanaugh's gaze on him intensified, and he paused as he realized that he had been rubbing his chest through his t-shirt, soothing the aching spot directly over his heart. Hart pulling himself up off the floor gave his brother something else to focus on, releasing Harbin from the hold of his knowing gaze. Harbin dragged his focus back to the current situation, too, aware that at any moment the fight might escalate and he would have to step in to help his friends. He had brought them to this place, and he was fucking damned if they were going to end up hurt because of him. They were navigating dangerous waters, and he doubted there was a way to settle the dispute without more violence. He was always the first to pick a fight over diplomacy, but he also knew when to pick a fight. He scanned the gathered immortals, fey, and mortals. The odds were against them. His side were highly trained and highly skilled, but then so was the enemy. An elf commander, an elf prince, a demon king, and two huntresses from Archangel were more than a match for him, heart, and fury. When he added Kiter and the elf female, the scales were tipped in their favor. He doubted Kavanaugh would fight on his side. This nightclub was his home now, and snow leopards protected their homes and their prides. Darkness welled in Harbin's stomach at that, and he swallowed hard in an attempt to settle it as he tried to pretend that thought hadn't cut him to the bone and left him reeling. He had failed as a member of his noble species, but he wouldn't fail again. Hard and fury were his pride. The guild was his home. He would protect them both. Blue stared at Hart, a troubled edge to his eyes that Harbin liked even less than the one that had been all about violence. He was trying to place Hart, and Harbin knew enough about family to know that he was going to lose his shit when he realized who Hart was. Hart locked his gaze on the female, wiped the back of his hand across his mouth, smearing blood over his cheek, and proved to Harbin that he was as mad as Fury and had a death wish to boot. If I had known you would turn out so damned beautiful, I might have married you after all. Blue's eyes widened in recognition. Kiter roared and hunkered down, his muscles coiling and fur flashing over his exposed skin as he prepared to launch himself at Hart. Blue was there before he could move a muscle, teleporting right in front of Hart as he walked back towards the female. Harbin grimaced as Blue's fist slammed into Hart's face with so much force that the crack of bone was audible in the strained silence, and Hart flew across the room again. His boss growled and teleported, reappearing right in Blue's face. The male didn't even flinch. He grabbed Hart by the throat and shoved him away. Focus, the elf prince said to the mortal female, and Harbin willed her to do it, because they were going to lose Loki if she didn't. Whatever they were doing, it had been making the dragon stronger, but now he was growing weaker again. Blue will handle this mess, will you not, Blue? Yes, my prince. Blue gave a stiff jerk of his head and a black blade appeared in his right hand. Hart flexed his fingers, his black scaled armor covering them and turning them into deadly claws. This was not going to end well. Blue launched himself at Hart and the two clashed, Hart swiftly blocking Blue's arm as he brought it down, his sword a black blur slicing through the colorful lights that filled the room near the bar where the elf prince and the mortal female worked on Loki. The elf commander leaped back and attacked again, quicker this time, and Hart didn't have time to block Blue's arm with his own.
The blade struck Hart's forearm instead, and he growled as it sliced through the armor, cutting into his flesh. Harbin snarled and stepped forwards, and Kavanaugh's hand came down hard on his shoulder. He wanted to shirk his brother's grip, but he planted his bare feet to the floor instead, heeding his warning not to intervene. Not yet, anyway. But if it looked as if Blue would seriously injure Hart, he was going to take the elf down and he wouldn't be alone. Fury paced in the darkness, prowling there like a wraith, a terrible shadow ready to bring bloodshed and death to any who dared to stray into his path. Blue shoved Hart in the chest and Hart flew across the room. His back slammed into the bar near the mortal female, shaking the black wood and jostling Loki. The female turned and pinned him with a furious look before sweeping her gaze around the room, her anger flowing from her in warning waves. Will you all go in the other damned room or something? I'm trying to fucking concentrate. Hart's violet eyes gained a guilty edge, and he wasn't alone in his feelings. Everyone had stopped to look at her, and all of them were now looking elsewhere. All of them except Blue. Take the fight elsewhere, Blue, the elf prince snapped. The male didn't listen to him. He glared at Hart, his violet eyes darkening to a dangerous degree. Stay away from my sister, you assassin scum. I hear even a rumor that you merely looked at her in the wrong way and I will kill you. Tainted bastards like you deserve to be put down. Shock washed across the female elf's face. Tainted? It's nothing. Hart shoved away from the bar, avoiding her steady gaze. His words had no effect on her. She continued to watch him with worry in her eyes, and Hart continued to pretend she didn't exist. Harbin had never seen his cool and collected leader so flustered. It didn't show on the surface, but he could see beneath that practiced facade. Blue's words had rattled him, hitting too close to the mark. Hart shot him a glare. Get a move on, Harbin, or we're leaving you behind. Harbin could understand his sudden desire to leave. It wasn't only for his own sake, it was for Furies. Elves viewed the tainted as something that needed to be exterminated, a stain on their race. Hart wasn't even close to being tainted, but someone else in the room was, and his boss had just realized the danger that male was in. Hart teleported and reappeared next to Fury in the shadowy side of the room, drawing Blue's gaze there. Harbin's muscles tensed coiling in readiness as he waited for the elf to mention how tainted Fury was in attempt to kill him. Not on his watch. He would take the elf out of action if he tried anything. Blue's violet eyes widened, and the words that left his lips weren't ones filled with anger or hatred, but ones holding a wealth of shock that seemed to deal a blow to the elf who uttered them. Commander Fury, I thought you were dead. Fury's expression shifted on hearing his name turning darker than usual, and the sensation of danger he radiated increased, warning that he was on the verge of attacking. It didn't stop Blue from taking a step towards him, the surprise that had been in his voice slowly painting itself across his face as he stared at Fury. Fury snarled, hunger sparking in his black eyes, a dark need to spill blood. Blue recognized him, but Fury didn't seem to have a clue who he was. How did the elf commander know Fury? Harbin looked to Hart for an answer, but his boss averted his violet gaze, fixing it on Fury, a flicker of concern in it. How did you survive Vale's attack? Blue whispered, and the elf prince turned to face the room, his hand falling away from the mortal female's neck as he stared across the room at Fury, his stunned expression matching Blue's. Fury remained silent, glaring at the two elves now his fingers twitching at his sides. He wanted to attack, but he wasn't, and that stunned Harbin. Normally Fury attacked first and asked questions later, a policy that Harbin had difficulty with since it usually meant they were trying to question a corpse. Why wasn't he attacking now, when Harbin could see he was desperate to lash out? Did he know, Blue? What happened to you? Blue ventured another step towards him, this time, Fury reacted, but not as Harbin had expected. Rather than attacking, he backed away a step and threw a panicked look at Hart, his black eyes gaining a wild edge as he shook his head, causing the longer strands of his blue-black hair to brush his neck. Hart closed the small gap between them and placed his hand on Fury's shoulder, 
and Harbin could only stare as the touch calmed him and he drew down a deep, shuddering breath. The elf is tainted, the prince said, and Blue looked back at him. The male you knew no longer exists, Blue. Blue looked as if he didn't want to believe that, and it only left Harbin with more questions. Had they been close once, before whatever attack Blue had mentioned? Vale. The name was familiar. Harbin racked his brain trying to place it, and frowned when it came to him. Vale was the mad elf prince who had turned on his people. Hard had told him about the male once, but he had made Vale sound more like a legend told to scare young elves than a real person. The elf commander took another step towards Fury. Fury responded by pulling his black blade from the air and snarling at him. Hart shifted in front of Fury, partially shielding him with his body and placing his hand over the one Fury held his blade in, stopping him from attacking. Do you not recognize whose company you are in? Blue snapped, and Fury's dark gaze danced to the elf leader and back again. Do you not recognize your prince? Fury narrowed his black eyes on Blue and growled words in the elf tongue. Harbin didn't know the language, but he caught a name. Veil. Blue's expression twisted into darkness, long white daggers flashing between his lips as he snarled. Your prince is standing in this very room, not roaming hell bent on bloodshed and destruction. That wretched male is not your prince. Watch your tongue, Blue, the prince snapped and it seemed Fury wasn't the only one who still felt affection for a male that was apparently mad and evil, driven to kill all who stood in his path. Blue lowered his head, his unruly hair falling down to brush his forehead, and pressed his right hand to the black scales covering his chest. My apologies, my prince. Loki groaned and shifted, and Harbin's gaze leaped to him. The big dragon shifter stole all of the attention away from Fury but only held Harbin's for a few seconds, as long as it took for him to sense that he was stronger now, safe. He looked back at Fury, focusing on him as Hart worked to calm him. He had never realized before today just how much affection Hart held for the tainted elf, but he could see it now as the male stroked his shoulder and hand and spoke to him in a low voice, slowly coaxing him back from the brink. Was Hart the only reason Fury wasn't roaming hell like the prince he admired, wreaking havoc and leaving a trail of blood in his wake? Fury lowered his hand and his shoulders sagged, his lips parting as his breath left him, and the tension seemed to wash from his limbs. His black blade disappeared and Hart glanced down to where it had been and then back at his face, saying something in the elf tongue that Harbin wished he could understand. He had always wondered about Fury but now he had more questions and now he needed to hear the answers to them. He wanted to know what had happened to push Fury so close to the brink and propel him into life as an assassin. Harbin! Hart caught hold of Fury's wrist. The elf lowered his eyes to it, the black slashes of his eyebrows rising as he stared at Hart's hand, a distant look on his face. He blinked slowly and Harbin had the impression that he wasn't quite with them. Hart had told him once that sometimes Fury lost the fight against the darkness, but that he always came back. Harbin could see now that his boss had been putting things too simply, skimming over some of the facts. The darkness had swallowed Fury, but it had been Hart that had drawn him back to the light, and now Fury looked lost and confused, as if he couldn't recall what had happened during the time he had been consumed by the darkness that lived inside him. The worry shining in Hart's violet eyes warned the calm wouldn't last, that Fury would remember everything that had happened, and that was the reason his boss was suddenly so desperate to leave. I might be a while. Go on without me. I need to finish my mission and then I'll meet you, Harbin said, and nodded when Hart looked relieved. Hart tossed one last look towards Blue, where he now stood beside his sister with Kiter at his side. Silvery light chased over him and Fury, and then he was gone. Blue muttered something in the elf tongue, his gaze sliding towards Harbin, filled with a dark desire that Harbin recognized, because he had felt that same hunger running in his blood countless times. Blue wanted to force him to leave, too. He wanted to attack him. The prince responded, his tone equally black and threatening. 
Harbin stepped forwards, but Kavanaugh suddenly blocked his path. He looked up at his brother, expecting to find him protecting his friends. He wasn't. He stood with his bare back to Harbin and growled at the two elves, bearing huge canines. He was protecting him. A wave of tingles raced over his skin, shooting down his spine, and he wasn't sure how to process everything that had happened in the last thirty minutes. He had come to this place expecting to find a bitter, angry male who wanted nothing to do with him. He hadn't expected to find a male who was unchanged by their years apart, still quick to defend him despite his failings, still protecting him, still loving him after everything he had done. Enough! No more fighting! Kyder scrubbed a hand down his face and then over his wild, sandy hair, his expression filled with weariness. The elf female sidled closer to him and caressed his arm. He turned a frown on her, but it melted away, softening as he lifted his hand and stroked her cheek. Her smile caused his eyes to darken, hunger surfacing in them, desire that had the female snow leopard dancing back into Harbin's mind. His gaze strayed back to the exit as need flooded him again, a deep ache to find her. He stared at the doors as the night called to him his primal instincts urging him to seek her and see that she was safe. He needed to protect her. He needed her. She was vital to him, a piece of him that he had been missing his entire life, and with her he knew that he would be complete. A ridiculous notion, one he wanted to dismiss but found he couldn't. She was more than just another female. She was beautiful. No, she was breathtaking. She was power and vulnerability, grace and deadliness, and a whole range of entrancing impossibilities rolled into one incredible female. He took a step towards the doors, driven to hunt her. He would find her. She would be his. Chapter 11 Kavanaugh snagged Harbin's arm, and he heard his brother talking but he couldn't make out the words as he was dragged across the low-lit main room of the nightclub, his eyes constantly fixed on the doors and his heart pounding with a need to find the female. It was only when they passed through a door and it slammed shut, stealing the exit from view, that the urge shattered. Harbin looked around the bright white expansive back room of the club, slowly coming back to the world as the need to hunt faded. Kavanaugh stared at him, a keen edge to his silver eyes one that unsettled Harbin. He would rather his brother exploded with anger and raged about the things he had done and how he had disappeared for two decades than face what he felt with a certain sense of impending doom was about to happen. Conflict he could handle, discussing the obvious reason behind why his focus kept slipping and drifting towards a specific location he couldn't. He preferred to hold his personal business close to his chest and his feelings even closer beyond view of anyone, especially now they were coming back to life, roused by the female snow leopard. He had expected meeting his brother again to cause the rising tide of his emotions to overwhelm him, bursting the barrier he had built around them. What he hadn't anticipated was the calm he felt in Kavanaugh's presence, a soothing sensation that eased him and seemed to ground him, instead of pushing him over the brink. Rather than being swallowed in a dark flood of emotions, he floated on calm waters, drifting in the light. Harbin glanced back towards the door, his thoughts returning to the female snow leopard. She had the same effect on him, and he wasn't sure how to process that. Even when he had been in the grip of the darkness that lived inside of him back in the Archangel facility, one look into her eyes, even the briefest of glances, had poured light into his soul and soothed him giving him back control. Kavanaugh took a step towards him, stealing his focus away from the female, and he caught the look in his brother's silver eyes, one that warned he was on the verge of bringing up something that Harbin couldn't bring himself to speak about, because that would mean acknowledging it. That would make it real, and he wasn't sure he was ready for that, because it would cause a war to erupt inside him, a battle between the darkness born of his past and his vendetta and the part of him that secretly strived towards the light. A familiar smell sent relief coursing through him, but it lasted only as long as it took the pretty snow-leopard female to descend the staircase against the far wall of the white room. 
Eloise rubbed her must chestnut hair, her golden brown eyes hazy with sleep as she carefully took each step. What was all the noise about? She reached the bottom step, yawned, and tripped, her bare toes snagging in her loose baby blue pajama bottoms and sending her tumbling forwards. Cavanaugh was across the room in a heartbeat, catching her in his arms and drawing her close to his bare chest. She curled into him for a second before lifting her head and welcoming the soft press of Cavanaugh's lips against hers. Harbin looked down at his bare feet and turned his cheek to them, trying to shut them out as the war he had feared erupted inside of him, flooding his mind with images of the female snow leopard who had betrayed him. The torrent swept him along, one moment flashing a replay of her as she spoke the words that had cut him to his soul, telling him that she had betrayed him, and the next making him relive the moment when he had kissed her. She had tasted so sweet, had felt so fucking good in his arms. He needed to know about her, and that was the real reason he had come to see Kavanaugh. He had wrapped it up in another cause in order to make it easier on himself, pretending he had come to Underworld purely to give his friends a safe place to rest and recuperate, because the darker part of himself still wanted to lash out whenever he thought about the female in any way other than as a mark, a mission. She had him twisted in knots, and he hated it. He had become accustomed to the darkness inside him, the emotionless state he had embraced in order to survive, in order to keep his past locked away and stop it from destroying him. Now she had awakened the light, had unleashed his emotions from their cage, and he was no longer sure how to proceed. That darker side wanted to destroy her instead now, hungered to take her and the Archangel Huntress down. He wanted to protect himself. He couldn't handle what she had done to him, luring him, trapping him, betraying him. He tunneled his fingers through his silver hair and pulled it back, tugging so hard that it hurt. Gods, why couldn't he hate her as he hated the Archangel Huntress? Why did he feel as if he was walking towards his doom and he couldn't change his course, couldn't avert the disaster looming ahead of him, one that would annihilate him? If he let her sneak into the heart he defended so vigilantly, she would have the power to destroy him. Fuck, the part of him that wouldn't shut the hell up said that she had already done it. She had broken through that barrier. He couldn't stop thinking about her. Couldn't control the craving he had for her or his need of her. Not even the terrible thing she had done was enough to make him hate her. He wanted to hate her. He wanted to shield himself from the pain he could feel coming and it was safer to hate her than to love her and have her take that and break him with it by throwing it back in his face. Kavanaugh's steady gaze on him was joined by Eloise's, and he fought to pull himself out of the mire of his thoughts and regain his focus. He needed to know about the female he had encountered, but that didn't mean he was going to let his guard down around her. He couldn't deny his need to know who she was or the one that drove him to find her and set things straight with her, so she would know the truth about Archangel and would be safe. But he could deny the urges running rampant through him and protect his heart. Harbin lifted his head and looked at his brother, grimacing as he caught Kavanaugh petting Eloise again with a stupid, sappy look on his face. If anyone would know the members of their pride, Kavanaugh was that male. He had cared enough about his kin to take the time to know everyone to understand the smallest things about them, also he could converse with them on a daily basis. Kavanaugh had been born to be a leader of their pride, a male worthy of the role of Alpha. A male worthy of the mate he now held gently in his arms, whispering tender things to her that Harbin wished he couldn't hear, because they only stirred the primal need that had taken root within him, making him want to hunt the female he had left behind at Archangel. He needed to find her, but first he had to understand more about her. He needed to know who she was. Kavanaugh. He waited for his brother to finally release his mate, before sucking down a deep breath and pushing the words out. I have to talk to you about someone. Someone. Kavanaugh frowned and shifted to face him, and Eloise remained on the step beside him. Her hand slipped into his, and Harbin glanced at them, feeling a sharp pang in his chest as he watched his brother's larger hand curling around hers, holding it tightly. Gods. 
Even something as stupid as that made him ache to see the female again. What the hell was wrong with him? The voice that had been constantly whispering in his mind since first setting his eyes on her murmured that he knew what was wrong with him. He was just afraid to acknowledge it. He shut it out. The female was a mark, by her own choice, and had orchestrated a plan to capture him and put him into Archangel's hands. She wanted revenge, and that made her dangerous. He had escaped, thwarting whatever plan she'd had for him, but he doubted he had seen the last of her. He needed to know more about her if he was going to convince her that she didn't want his head on the chopping block. She wanted Archangel's. A mark, he started. Apparently that word didn't sit well with his brother, because Kavanaugh's eyes darkened rapidly. Maybe his brother hadn't believed the elves when they had called him and his friends assassins, or maybe he had thought only heart and fury operated in that line of business. It would be just like his brother to try to see some good in him and refuse to believe he was capable of spending his days killing others for profit. She's a mark, but she placed the contract on herself. Archangel captured her twenty years ago. He stumbled when Kavanaugh's expression shifted, pain flooding his handsome face as his silver eyes brightened, and shook off his own hurt in order to continue. They harmed her and others, and they fed her lies and she believed them. She thinks I sold her out. He waited for either Kavanaugh or Eloise to say that he had in a way but both of them remained silent as they looked at each other and then back at him. I need to know who she is, and I thought maybe you could help. Although he wasn't sure that coming to Underworld had been such a great idea, because being around his brother was plain merry hell with him. Being near the female had been bad enough, reawakening the softer emotions that had no part in an assassin's life. But being around Kavanaugh was infinitely worse. It took him back beyond twenty years, to a time when they had lived together in peace, enjoying life to the full. A brighter and better time, one he hadn't realized he missed until he had seen Kavanaugh and Eloise together again. How many times had they all trekked from the village together, heading high into the mountains to shift and play chase, to burn some energy? How many times had they all crashed in front of a blazing fire afterwards, spent and tired from the exertion, and aching and sore from laughing so hard as they talked? Gods, those days felt like a distant memory that belonged to someone else. Something beautiful he had witnessed from the outside rather than experienced. Did you get a good look at her? Kavanaugh's deep voice rumbled through the room and Harbin pulled himself back to it. He nodded, keeping his features schooled and emotions locked away, because his brother was watching him closely, and any slip would give away that he had done a lot more than just get a good look at the female in question. Jaw-length silver hair, but she dyes it black. I'm guessing she wants to blend in and lay low. Silver gold eyes, about this tall. He held his hand at around shoulder height to him. She give you those? Kavanaugh pointed at Harbin's right cheek. He was touching the marks before he could stop himself, his focus slipping as he recalled her taste on his tongue, and how warm and soft her body had felt against his. You're on the cusp. Harbin snapped back to the room, ice blasting through his veins and cooling his hungers, as his brother's words sank in and he met his silvery gaze. It challenged Harbin to deny it and he wanted to, but the words refused to leave his lips. Kavanaugh sighed. I wish I could help, but several females at the village had eyes like that and silver hair. I'm guessing you got more than a good look at her. So, did she have any scars? Any marks of any kind that would give me more to go on? Harbin frowned at the floor and pictured her. It didn't take much effort. The moment he thought about her, she popped into his head, wearing just her white underwear. Damn, he had loved the feel of her curves beneath his hands. He hadn't realized he had growled until Kavanaugh was right in front of him, his left hand clamped down on his right shoulder. His brother hadn't done it to soothe him. He had done it to anchor him in place in order to protect Eloise. The slender female was tucked behind Kavanaugh, 
a wary look in her golden eyes. She was safe. He wasn't interested in her. Fuck. He wasn't interested in any of the females he could smell in the club. There was only one that he wanted. Her. She had a scar. Here. He ran his index finger across his right collarbone. It was old. Cavanaugh turned pensive, silent for so long that hope began to build in Harbin's chest. It faded when his brother shook his head. I don't remember anyone with a scar like that. Maybe she picked it up after leaving the pride or kept it hidden. Harbin exhaled hard. It was a lost cause then. He had been banking on his brother being able to tell him more about the female, in the hope that he would be able to place her and remember her. His memories of his time at the Pride were fragmented now, churned up so much that unless he had a specific one he wanted to recall, he couldn't get them to fall into order. Maybe he hadn't known the female before, but if he hadn't, why had she felt so familiar? She kept it hidden. Those words leaving Eloise's lips had him staring at her in stunned silence. She came out from behind Cavanaugh, moving to stand beside her mate. I know her. Gods, had his heart just done a ridiculous jump in his chest? You do. Heat flooded him, hope carried with it, and he couldn't stop himself from inching closer to Eloise, eager to hear what she knew of the female. We played together, and she got that scar falling out of the rafters of the barn when we were small. Eloise's soft pink lips tugged into a wistful smile. Her name was, um... Harbin barely stopped himself from grabbing her shoulders and shaking the answer out of her. Aya. He stumbled back a step as that name hit him, dragging him back beyond twenty years, to another twenty before. It transported him to a small classroom and a boring lecture about snow leopards that he had been itching to escape. Cavanaugh had promised to take him into the mountains to hunt after his lessons, and he had spent the day caught up in fantasizing about it, eager for the day to be over. He had been the snow leopard equivalent of an adolescent, appearing in his late teens to mortal eyes, but sixty years of age in reality. He hadn't taken in much of what the teacher had been saying, talking about the phases of a snow leopard's life, from birth to sexual maturity and beyond. None of the class had been close to that stage in their lives, all of them at least four decades away from maturity. He remembered her. He remembered the fresh-faced and freckled daughter of their teacher, and how her eyes had always sparkled like the pale sun suspended above their mountain home. He remembered because she had been the first girl he had kissed. Well, she had kissed him. The bell had rung to signal the end of the day, and they had been walking together. He could still feel the sun on his face and smell the crisp, fresh snow on the ground. It had been one of the rare times she had walked with him back towards the village square, and she had talked to him this time rather than shuffling along in awkward silence. She had asked whether he thought that not being sexually mature meant they couldn't have sex or wouldn't enjoy it. She had blushed, he remembered that, because it had made him blush too. She had worded it in a way that had made it sound as if she had been talking about them having sex. He hadn't given any thought to that sort of thing before that moment, but fuck, he had started thinking about it then. They had walked a little deeper into the village, along the narrow alleyways between the older buildings at one end of it, with their pale stone ground floor and their upper floor with its crisp white panels surrounded by elegant carved dark wood. The mountain peaks that surrounded three sides of the village had shown between the low-angled wooden roofs of the buildings, reaching towards the clear blue sky and stealing the focus of his eyes, allowing his mind to wander a different path to his feet. When they had come close to the square, he hadn't been able to hold his tongue. He had asked whether she thought they would enjoy anything intimate before they had matured. She had countered his question by asking what sort of things. And gods, he had said kissing, because kissing had been on his mind. There had been numerous couples in the village, and he had seen many of them kissing, and his natural curiosity had always focused on it, making him wonder what it would feel like and why they did it. He hadn't quite known what to do when she had looked around them at the empty alleys and then grabbed his hand, 
dragging him behind the stone base of the nearest building and pressing him against it. Her hands had scalded his chest through his jacket when she had leaned into him and tiptoed, and he hadn't been able to take his eyes off her lips as they had neared his. His heart had been racing, blood thundering, and then she had set him on fire with a clumsy kiss that still had him burning forty years later. It hadn't taken him long to find his feet and have her pinned against the wall, his body caging hers as he kissed her harder, desperate for more of her. That time he had kissed her, she had welcomed it, wrapping her arms around him and tugging him closer. He had bumped against her and snow had rained down his back, the icy chill nothing when he was burning from the fumbled kiss, losing himself in her. Only the crunch of boots on compacted snow had broken them apart, and she had hurried ahead of him down the alleyway. He had followed her home, seeing her there safe, before returning to his own one, still lost in a daze from the feel of her kiss and the urges she had awoken in him. Fuck. He had dreamed of that kiss for weeks. He had wanted to do it a thousand times over again, and had gone to school every morning filled with the hope he would see her again and she would let him kiss her. She had avoided him, though, always fleeing whenever he found her alone and in the end he had been nothing more than a typical teenage boy. She hadn't wanted to kiss him. She had made that clear with her behavior towards him, and so he had found a female who did. He had embraced the passion she had unleashed in him, working his way from kissing and fumbled touches to betting the females who approached him, all of them eager to attempt to secure a place of power within his family by securing him as their mate. He hadn't been interested in a mate or anything resembling a relationship. He had been consumed by lust and a desire to learn more, to sate his needs, and he had. Being immature, he hadn't been able to impregnate the females, so he had slept with them freely, not thinking about whether they were interested in more than sex with him because he wasn't interested in anything beyond fucking them. When he had grown bored of the females in the village, he had started heading down into the town, sleeping with the mortal females there, knowing he couldn't impregnate them either, so he could do as he pleased with zero consequences. Or so he had thought until the fateful night the archangel Huntress had set her sights on him. Harbin scrubbed a hand down his face and groaned as he realized that Aya had spent twenty years seeing him chasing other females, after she had been the one to give him his first kiss. He hadn't really given any thought to how it might hurt her, but he suspected now that it had, and that hurt had made her an easy target for Archangel's lies. Gods, she had to hate him, despise him. It was a lost cause, but he couldn't deny his need to find her and explain, to make her see that he hadn't sold her out. He couldn't deny his need of her. It was primal and deep, the call of the wild, and it demanded things of him that he had no right to feel or desire not when there was zero hope. He had made sure of that by whoring himself in the village with the pride females and down in the town with the mortal ones. He had made his bed and now he would have to lie in it, alone, forever. A female like Aya would never want a male like him. She could never forgive his sins. She could never love him. Because he didn't deserve to be forgiven or loved. Harbin watched as Cavanaugh tucked a rogue strand of hair behind Eloise's ear and lingered with his fingers on her neck, his silver gaze soft with love and flooded with warmth. Eloise lifted her hand and placed it over his, holding it against her as she turned her head, closed her eyes and pressed a kiss to the heel of his palm. Harbin shut his eyes and tried to stifle the pain as the past and the present clawed at him ripping away the softer parts and leaving his chest hollow and cold again. He didn't deserve what Kavanaugh had. He didn't deserve a faded female. The one female in the universe meant solely for him, and the only one he could truly bond with to forge a connection that most snow leopards could only dream of, because finding your mate was more than merely rare. It was almost impossible. Male snow leopards searched the globe for their faded one and most never found her. His had been in front of him all along, and he had been too blinded by lust, too overwhelmed by desire to see her, and now she was lost to him.
His animal side cried out, and he couldn't contain the pained roar that left his lips. A call filled with the yearning that had been growing inside him, one he felt sure was going to consume and destroy him. A call for his mate. A call for Aya. Chapter 12 Aya paused mid-step and looked back along the alleyway between the brick buildings, sure she had sensed someone behind her. No one was there. She waited a few seconds more, studying the shadows of the quiet London side street, and then started walking again, heading towards the main road that would take her to her small apartment. She pulled her thick gray wool jacket closed over her mulberry jumper, folding her arms across her chest, and kept her head down as she walked, her leather boots loud in the silence of the night. It wasn't the first time she'd had the unsettling sensation since making her excuses and leaving the Archangel facility. The first time had been that same night, a few hours after Harbin the Dragon and many other prisoners had escaped, Rocky included. She might have had a hand in helping some of them, but Archangel didn't need to know that. They had been a little too happy for her to leave after questioning her, and she suspected they were going to be watching her for a while so she had been keeping her distance from Switch and any of the escaped Fey and Immortals. At first she had put the odd sensation down to them tailing her, but she had sensed no one near her. When she had studied the feeling, setting aside her fear that Archangel were coming for her and those she cared about, she had discovered something unsettling. It wasn't a sense that she was in danger. It didn't stem from the feeling that someone was stalking her. It tugged at her animal side, making it restless and that was why she had automatically associated it with her being in danger. When it was quite the opposite, her snow leopard side was drawn to the source of the sensation, so much so she had woken last night to find herself standing at the window of her bedroom, on the verge of lifting the sash. She had wanted to shift and drop to the pavement below, had ached with the need to seek the origin of the call that drummed in her blood and lured her to it. Harbin. Gods damn him. She hadn't anticipated this. It was a complication she didn't need, not when her head was already tied in knots, her thoughts still tangled. It felt impossible to find the end of the right thread, the one she could pull to make the whole ball unravel so she could finally know what to believe. She hadn't found the courage to question Archangel about what they had told her all those years ago, or the huntress who had been the one to meet with her. But she was beginning to believe Harbin. Little by little, day by day, that belief grew, and the faith she'd had in Archangel weakened. Little by little, the need for answers grew, too. And more than once, she found herself standing outside Underworld, staring at the sign and considering going in. She hadn't lied to Rocky when she had said she avoided the club because a snow leopard shifter worked in it, and she had wanted to stay away from him. But she hadn't exactly told him the entire story. Harbin's brother was the Snow Leopard Shifter, and until recently, he had been the alpha of her pride. She wasn't sure that he would recognize her, but she feared that he would, or that Harbin had been in contact with him and that he would try to detain her. Harbin was still in London. She knew it because if he had left the city, she would no longer feel drawn to him. The compulsion to find him would have faded as the distance between them had grown, until it had finally died completely. He wasn't staying at Underworld, though, or at least he hadn't been there the time she had ended up outside it, because she hadn't felt him nearby. The closer she came to him, the stronger the pull towards him grew. It was part of the reason she couldn't face him in order to get the answers she needed. It was too dangerous. The pull she felt towards him was already strong, while the distance between them was no doubt great. If she was in his presence, it would be unbearable. She wasn't sure she would be able to control her primal urges, and she was damned if she was going to surrender to them and to Harbin. His kiss had rocked her, shaken her world all over again, but she wasn't going to make the same mistake twice and believe it had meant anything. The last time she had stood outside Underworld, she had caught his scent, though. Aya paused again, the memory of his smell flowing through her the masculine mix of spice and snow warming her despite her best efforts to not allow it to affect her. God's help her. She wished Harbin would leave the city and release her from his wicked spell, because she wasn't sure how much more she could take. 
She hadn't been prepared for how deeply seeing him again would affect her, turning her world and her feelings on their axis, and leaving her thinking about him almost constantly, dreaming about him. The nightmares of her past no longer haunted her sleep. He did. A vision of sensuality and danger, an alluring and tempting male that she never quite found the will to resist. If she couldn't resist him in her dreams, how could she expect to do so in reality if their paths crossed? His kiss had shocked her, had made her realize just what he was to her, and she had wanted to flee in that moment, to run and not look back. She still wanted to run away, even as the rest of her wanted to run towards him. She wasn't strong enough to deal with this turn of events. He had crushed her heart once, and it had never completely recovered from that blow. She wouldn't risk it again, because she feared this time the damage would be devastating and permanent. But she still needed answers, or she was going to go mad. She had to know whether he had been telling her the truth, and Archangel had used and betrayed him. Maybe she could call Underworld and ask to speak with Kavanaugh. That way she would get her answers and she would remain safe. Although she wasn't sure how honest Kavanaugh would be with her, he had been her pride's alpha, a position where he had been responsible for being truthful to his kin and open with them. But he was also Harbin's brother. There was a high chance that the behavior towards his kin that had been ingrained in him wouldn't stop him from doing all in his power to protect his brother. There was a chance he would lie in order to pull her into the web of deceit Harbin had spun and snare her so that the male could find her. Because he was hunting her, she knew it in her heart, sensed it during the time she felt compelled to find him. He had been close to her every time, watching her from a distance. She was his mark, but more than that, she had heard him, and she was beginning to understand that he had grown into a male who embraced vengeance over walking away. The pride had taught the latter, instilling a desire for peace in all of its members, and Harbin had turned his back on that. He had changed dramatically, transforming into the dangerous male now after her. An assassin. Because of Archangel? She had to know the answer to that question, because she felt she was going to go mad if she didn't get it. She couldn't allow her fear of Harbin finding her and what she might do if it happened to control her moves and her thoughts. Kavanaugh was a good male, and as much as he loved his younger brother, he wouldn't hand her over to him. He had proven himself a male who preferred to take the peaceful route over the violent, and a male who would never place a member of his pride in danger. He would protect her from whatever plan Harbin had for her if she went to him. He was no longer the Alpha, but he was still the male she had known her entire life, one dedicated to protecting others. She hoped. The tiny seed of doubt took root in her mind and began to grow. Kavanaugh had left the pride. She had heard the rumors. He had left it in the hands of a male unworthy of the position of Alpha, and many had suffered. He had allowed his people to come to harm. A chill went through her. He might do the same to her. She pushed back against her doubts and drew down a deep breath to steady herself. She also knew that Kavanaugh had had a good reason for wanting to free himself of the role of Alpha, one she couldn't hold against him although phoning the nightclub still sounded more appealing than risking her neck, or her heart. Aya mounted the steps of her apartment building, slid her key into the lock of the main glass door, and twisted it at the same time as pushing it open. A low-lit hall greeted her, not the cleanest of spaces, but it was home. She trudged up the stairs to her floor, her thoughts stuck on repeat, replaying the terrifying moment when Archangel had broken with their plan and had lifted the barrier between her and Harbin, allowing him to charge into her side of the room. She had thought her number was up, that he was going to kill her, and then he had been kissing her. Gods, he had kissed her. It had been almost forty years since their first fumbled kiss, and she had been close to many other males in that time. But no kiss had made her burn as Harbin's did. He set her body on fire with only a brush of his lips and had her resolve melting, her limbs turning to rubber, when he turned up the heat and his kiss grew more demanding. She warmed inside and lost herself for a moment, forgetting where she was, transported back to that room and the way his hard body had caged her and his lips had mastered her, body and soul. 
God's helper. She shook herself out of her daze and pushed on, striding down the narrow dark corridor to her apartment door. She opened it, stepped inside, and pressed her back to the door as it closed behind her, her breath leaving her on a sigh. She had to pull herself together. She was stronger than this. Harbin was an enemy, a danger to her, and the quicker she realized that, the better. She couldn't trust him. He made a living deceiving people in order to kill them. He wasn't the male she had grown up with, the one who had never stopped smiling and had relished every challenge the mountains had thrown at him, tackling it with glee. He was no longer carefree and full of light and laughter. He was darkness embodied, dangerous and deadly, a shadow of the male he had once been. He would kill her because she was a job to him. That was the only reason he had followed her into Archangel. It hadn't been to protect her and ensure that she was safe, not as a male of his status should have behaved. It hadn't been to be near to her and comfort her to ease her fears, as a lover would have chosen. It had been to be near her so he could find an opportunity to end her. Aya turned, flicked all the locks, and slid the chains into place, and kicked off her boots. She shirked her jacket as she turned away from the door in her dark apartment and tossed it over the back of her couch to her left and tugged her jumper off. The air was chilly in the apartment, her gray t-shirt offering her little protection from the cold, but she didn't care. She was used to temperatures far below what London felt even in deepest winter. Her gaze roamed to the clock above the TV on the far wall, her sensitive eyes able to make out the hands in the darkness. It was late, already creeping into the next day. She yawned as her strength faded, the constant adrenaline rush of walking the streets and being on alert for both Archangel and Harbin, leaving her drained and weary. She glanced at the couch and TV to her left, and then at the door in the wall to her right, and couldn't stop her feet from carrying her towards it. Bed was too appealing, even when she knew she wouldn't find the rest she needed. Harbin would haunt her sleep and she would wake feeling more fatigued than ever. But it would end tonight. Tomorrow she would call Cavanaugh and she would make him tell her everything. She would finally discover the truth. She stripped off as she walked into her bedroom, leaving her clothes in a trail on the floor, and grabbed her small cream satin nightie as she passed it where it lay strewn on her dressing table. She slipped into it, yawned again, and flopped onto her bed. The thick duvet was a comfort cushioning her and immediately making the tension flow from her limbs. Another yawn pushed free and she sank into her bed, her focus slipping as sleep caught hold of her and pulled her down into the darkness. She would talk to Kavanaugh tomorrow. She would learn the truth about that night twenty years ago, and then she would ask him to speak with his brother and convince him to drop his mission. The comforting arms of sleep wrapped around her and she drifted in them for a time. Suspended in the peaceful darkness, her mind slowly emptying. Harbin refused to leave it. He wavered in front of her, staring at her as he had in the room, dressed in only a black pair of trunks, his body on full display for her eyes. They delighted in roaming his compact muscles as they flexed beneath his skin, barely an ounce of fat on him, all lean power that called to her most feminine instincts. Wild silver hair begged her fingers to brush through it, to tease it with a soft caress before tugging on it, giving him a brief flash of pain and her strength. Sharp silver eyes locked on her, intense and focused, drilling into her and heeding her wherever they touched. They drifted over her, the black chasms of his pupils growing wider as he lowered his focus to her breasts, and then the swell of her hips. Hunting her. Her every instinct screamed it at her, but it didn't make her scared this time. It thrilled her. There was desire in that look, hunger that matched her own, or maybe even surpassed it. It was need that spoke to her, coaxed her into taking a step towards him. His eyes darted up to hers, widening slightly before narrowing into a wicked look, one that made her heart skip a beat and then thump ever harder against her chest until her head swam and she felt sure she would pass out. He advanced on her, each slow step ratcheting up the heat flooding her veins, fanning the embers of her desire back into an inferno that burned her resolve to ashes. Long, powerful legs easily ate the distance between them, each stride coming faster until he was running at her.
She pressed back against the cool wall, her breaths coming quicker, too, until she was panting, aching for him to reach her. He stretched out a hand to her and disappeared as the room melted away, blinding white light drowning it out. Aya turned, breathing hard, her eyes darting around as she searched for Harbin. Only empty white greeted her wherever she looked, blurring together into nothingness. Hot breath fanned across her neck, a thousand tingles dancing down her spine in response and making her shudder in pleasure. She tried to turn, but strong hands clamped down on her upper arms, freezing her in place. She struggled and then gave up the fight, moaning as he stepped into her, his lean muscular body pressing against her back, his groin nestled against her bottom. Naked. She felt exposed and vulnerable, but it lasted only a heartbeat, the time that it took for him to lower his lips to her neck and press a kiss to the nape. A groan escaped her as her eyes slipped shut, hot pleasure rolling down her spine. He moaned with her, his breath moist on her skin, cranking up the bliss flowing through her. His fingers tightened against her arms as he moved closer, and her eyes shot open as she felt the hot, hard press of his cock against her lower back. His deep, guttural groan of pleasure as he dipped his body and rubbed himself against her had her eyes falling closed again, and her breath rushing from her as her body heated, burning at a thousand degrees. Fire blazed in her belly and lower, and she couldn't stop herself from arching her back and grinding against him. One calloused hand slid around her front, coming to cup her left breast, and she gasped and then moaned as he palmed it before thumbing her nipple, sending sparks shooting outwards from the stiffening peak. The heat traveled lower, turning her body liquid. She wriggled her hips, feeling the slide of desire between them, her need that she knew he could sense, because she could feel his, too. It wasn't just the demanding press of his cock between her buttocks that told her of it. It ran deeper, in her blood, in her soul. Her male hungered, and God's she hungered too. He growled, the sound sending another thrill through her, and she didn't stop him when he grasped her hair with his right hand, lifting it away from the nape of her neck and pinning it against her head, forcing it forwards. She whimpered as he tongued her nape and teased with a swift brush of blunt fangs. The slickness between her thighs grew with each sensual glide of his mouth over that spot, each wicked tease that tortured her and had her writhing against him, aching with her need. His left hand dropped from her breast and trailed lower, and she willed it onwards, over her rounded belly to the point where she needed him. His masculine groan of pleasure as he sucked on her neck, thrust his thick cock between her buttocks, and skirted the thatch of silver hair between her legs, made her knees weaken and her breath come quicker still. She opened her mouth to utter his name, to beg him to give her what she needed from him. His fingertips brushed lower, briefly dipped between her wet folds and pressed against her aroused nub. She barked out a moan as bliss rippled through her, and then growled as he stole it away removing his hand from between her thighs. His answering growl made her quiver and melt and rub against him, desperately coaxing him into surrendering to his desire. She gasped when he grabbed her left thigh and yanked it up, exposing her to the air that had suddenly turned frigid. She opened her eyes and they widened as she took in the familiar mountains towering over her and the endless pristine snow. She didn't feel the cold as she stared at her frigid homeland. The heat of his body kept it from hers. His hips slid lower, and her breath hitched as his lips stilled against the nape of her neck, and she felt the press of his fangs. Her primal instincts warned what was coming, and a trickle of fear ran through her. The blunt head of his cock nudged between her thighs. The sharp points of his fangs pressed against her neck, in the spot where he would bite when he claimed her as his mate. He growled. Aya shot up in bed as her instincts blared an alarm, and it took her a moment to gather her senses and realize that it wasn't the threat of Harbin claiming her as his mate that had awoken her. She shrieked and rolled off the left side of the bed as a man clad in black made a lunge for her, landed hard on her knees on the floor and shot to her feet. Another male closed in on her, and neither smelled of Archangel. They smelled of death. 
Aya's heart burst into overdrive, and she turned towards the sash window and shoved it up so hard that the glass fractured. She didn't hesitate as the cold night air rushed into the room. She pressed one foot to the sill and leaped out of the window, plummeting towards the hard tarmac in the alley below. The shift was swift to come, fur rippling over her skin as her bones distorted, pain rushing through her as they shrank or grew, cracking as they formed new shapes. Her tail sprang from the base of her spine, her nose flattened and grew wider, and her ears turned rounded and moved upwards as her shift completed, turning her into a sleek snow leopard. She twisted in the air, the wind whipping through her thick silver fur as she dropped, seeking a perfect landing. She wasn't quick enough. She cried out as she landed hard on the quiet road, fire sprinting up her limbs. She had to run. Aya kicked off and whimpered again as her right hind leg protested. She gritted her sharp teeth and growled through the pain. She couldn't let it slow her down. The men would be coming for her, and death would be swift to follow. Witches. She would know their rank scent anywhere. Many of their kind used hers in potions and spells, claiming their parts made the most potent ones, the most dangerous ones. She had learned to identify witches for that reason, not wanting to cross paths with them. She left whenever one ventured near her, slipping away before they noticed her, and avoided the fey towns where they peddled their spells. Aya looked back up at her window. These two felt different to the one she had run into before, though. Darker, more dangerous. She had to move fast. She lowered her gaze to the alley and froze. The two males stood before her, identical in every way, from their long black coats that concealed their bodies, to their inky black hair and their faces and haircuts. Twins. No wonder her instincts were screaming they were more dangerous than any witches she had encountered before. Twins shared magic, able to tap into each other, doubling the vast power at their disposal. They were feared by all, even other witches. When one twin was injured, the other only grew stronger, siphoning more of their sibling's magic. The magic wanted to save itself and would desert the weaker host, seeking the stronger one, making them even more formidable. In an attempt to protect itself, it would end up giving the stronger twins so much power that they would be able to heal their sibling without weakening themselves, giving them the ability to attack with multiple spells at the same time as they tended to their twin. Once the injured sibling was healed, the magic would split evenly between them again, until the next time one was wounded. It was a terrible cycle of power, an infinite circle that couldn't be broken, not even through death. Twins had the power to become necromancers, raisers of the dead. The two males stared at her, blue eyes glowing faintly in the darkness, a shimmering corona of blood around their jagged pupils, warning her that she was dealing with such witches. Aya turned tail to run the other way. A third male stood before her. His red eyes narrowed on her. Her body shifted against her will, her bones blazing with crippling fire. She cried out again the sound more human now as her face morphed back despite her attempts to hold her snow leopard form. Pain ricocheted through her, stealing her breath, and she shook from head to toe as the shift completed. She tried to move her hands, but they felt as heavy as her head, and all she could do was breathe and stare at the male with the red eyes. Triplets. It wasn't possible. The magic they shared would be vast, infinite. She managed to press her right hand to the tarmac, but her strength failed her as she attempted to push herself up off it. The male made a clucking noise with his tongue, as if her feeble attempts displeased him. What did he want with her? Footsteps sounded behind her, the other two males closing in. She kept her focus on the one in front of her because he was the one in command. The look in his eyes said that whatever they wanted— it would make the three years she had spent in captivity at Archangel look like a picnic. Her eyelids grew heavy and fatigue rolled through her, swiftly followed by panic as she tried to remain awake. She couldn't let them take her. She had to escape somehow. She just wasn't sure how. Her eyes slipped shut again. A scream pulled her back to the world, and she stared blankly at the fight in front of her. A frenetic blur of black and silver that she found hard to follow when her mind was foggy and heavy, and sleep kept tugging her back towards the darkness. 
A male bellowed in agony and she smelled blood, rich with a tang of magic. Witches. Twins. They were fighting someone. She had to escape the twins before they noticed. Her primal instincts whispered to her, correcting her and rousing her from her stupor. Not twins. Triplets. If two were fighting, one was elsewhere. She pushed back against the desire to sleep and screamed when she saw male hands on her, pulling her onto her back and revealing a face to her, handsome and lean, topped with neat dark hair. Shadows played in the contours of his face, but the darkness that clung to him couldn't hide one thing from her. Red eyes. The leader. A burst of strength went through her and she lashed out, slamming the flat of her palm into his face with as much force as she could manage. He grunted as it connected with his jaw and knocked him backwards, forcing him to release her. She sprang to her feet and ran for the wall, the pain in her twisted ankle forgotten as she made a break for it. He spat out something dark in the language of the demons, and his boots sounded on the tarmac. Her pulse accelerated and she leaped, hitting the brick wall ten feet up. She kicked off, twisted in the air, and shot towards the other building across the narrow alley. Her bare feet struck at first and she kicked off again, propelling herself upwards. The roof was close now. If she could reach it, she might be able to escape. Freedom was so close that she could taste it. She hit the wall, twisted and leaped again, gliding effortlessly towards the top of the second building. She sailed over the low wall surrounding the flat roof, landed and rolled, coming up onto her feet. Freedom looked a lot like death. Tall, wicked, and terrifying. Aya had a flash of her dream, felt a ghost of fangs against the back of her neck, and her body betrayed her, heeding in response, aching for the male that stood before her. He breathed hard, his chest heaving beneath his tight black t-shirt. The black fatigues and boots he had paired his top with caused him to blend into the night, little more than a deadly shadow. Only the moon outlined him, highlighting his wild silver hair and turning his skin pale. His right cheek bore more scratches than the one she had placed on it when he had kissed her, and a trickle of blood ran down to his jaw as she stared at him. Her eyes widened, silver and black. He had been the one fighting the two witches in the alley. Her breath left her in a rush. It wasn't possible that he had come charging in like some white knight to protect her. He wanted her dead. Didn't he? I killed one, but they'll be coming back for you he growled in a thick, deep voice that did funny things to her insides, making her quiver and forget that she was meant to be afraid of him. He was her mate, her male, her fated one, hers. She shoved that stupid notion and the instinct that had birthed it away, determined not to become a victim and lose her life because she had been muddled by the primal needs coursing through her. Harbin was her mate, she couldn't deny that, but he wasn't hers. He was just an assassin looking to claim her head, and probably a nice fat payoff in exchange for it. That was the only reason he had stopped those witches. He was protecting his interests, not her. He shattered that belief. You're not safe here anymore. Aya could only stare at him, struggling to take that in and make sense of it. He wanted her safe? He had been watching over her and had revealed himself the moment she had been in trouble rushing in to protect her, battling males who could have easily killed him and sold him for parts on the black market. For her. She shook her head, wanting to deny it. But it was there in his silver eyes. His expression was devoid of emotion, revealing nothing to her, as cold as a glacier and just as forbidding. But his eyes betrayed him and told her everything. He had wanted to protect her. He still wanted to protect her. I'm sorry he whispered, and she frowned. She was about to ask what part of the hell she had been through he was apologizing for when he raised his hand to his mouth. She heard a soft puff of air, felt the sharp sting in her neck, saw the world twirl into darkness. The last thing she knew before oblivion swallowed her was Harbin's scent of spice and snow, and the warmth of his arms around her. A muttered curse, and the soft press of his lips to the spot on her neck where the dart had struck. Chapter 13 Harbin had been tracking Aya for the past two nights, watching her from a distance and studying her every move. 
She followed a routine, leaving late in the evening and heading towards the underground station close to her small apartment in what he could only describe as one of the more unsavory regions of London. That was being kind. He had visited places in hell that were safer and cleaner. The first night he had hunted her down, locating her in what he now knew was her favorite restaurant in the neighborhood, he had wondered what the fuck had made her move into such a rough area. It hadn't taken him a long time spent perching on the corner of the roof of a building and watching the locals moving around the streets below to realize why she had come to this place. Fay and other species lived here. Her instincts as a snow leopard were driving her to find others similar to her in an effort to feel as if she was part of a pride. That instinct rode him sometimes, too, when he was away from the guild for weeks on end, driving him to return to the place his primal side had decided was home now and the people it viewed as his new pride. He sighed and tracked her as she walked, huddled into her thick gray coat, braced against the cold. Odd that she felt it so keenly having been raised in the mountains. He canted his head and hunkered down, balancing on his toes and resting his elbows on his knees. Life in the mortal cities had made her soft. It had changed her. Life in hell had changed him, too. But where she had softened, he had hardened. He could walk naked in the snow and not feel the cold. He could walk across fire and not feel the burn. He had mastered his body, had gained complete control over his emotions and decided what he felt. But she had broken that hold, and now he found himself coming to this same rooftop every night to watch her carrying out her life, running through her routine. First to stop on the steps of her red brick apartment building to button her coat over a heavy wool jumper, the color of which changed each night. Tonight it had looked like blood to him. Then she moved off, heading towards the central hub of the area she called home, stopping at her favorite restaurant. He hadn't realized she was partial to Italian food. But he did remember now that she was fond of food in general. It was the bane of his species. Living in a freezing climate meant they would have had to consume vast amounts of calories if they had been mortal. But they were shifters. Their metabolism ran at a faster pace, meaning they had to eat almost double the amount a mortal in such low temperatures would have to consume to remain alive. He had shaken his instincts to eat hearty meals when he had moved into the guild, slowly adjusting to the warmer climate. It seemed Aya hadn't quite adjusted enough. She made her way through a huge plate of pasta each night, together with bread and other accompaniments, and dessert. He smiled. She always had loved sweet foods. His smile faded as that thought came out of nowhere, hitting him head on and rattling him. What the fuck was he doing? Why did he come here every night to watch her? He scrubbed a hand down his face. Because he couldn't stay away. He tried every night, heading out in a different direction, mixing up what he did when he was out in the city, even ending up in front of one of the portals that would take him back to hell if he uttered the right words. No matter what he did, he always ended up back here, watching her. Fuck, he had even tried hitting up a Fay strip club. That had lasted around a minute. The amount of time it had taken him to glance at every female present and realize none of them were a patch on Aya. He growled and shoved his fingers through his hair, tugging it hard. How many times was he going to have to remind himself that she had tricked him into tracking her down by placing a contract on her own head? just so he would end up in Archangel's hands. She had betrayed him. He had vowed that he would talk with her, ensuring she knew the truth about the people she had trusted, the ones who had tortured her for years and poisoned her mind with their lies. And then, well, he wasn't sure what happened then. Either he killed her or he gave her a chance to cancel the contract and walked away. He was sure that once he was back in hell, his arse on the line in another mission, that he would soon forget about her and his life would return to normal. Killing, healing, and then fucking whatever piece of arse took his fancy. Rinse and repeat. His heart whispered treacherous words and he tried to ignore them, but they refused to go away, circling his mind like vultures bent on picking at a carcass. His carcass. The one that had been devoid of a soul for years, following a meaningless routine. The death and the pain had been glorious, had made him feel alive. 
screwing a stranger in some grimy back alley just to scratch the biological itch that rode him ever harder as he came closer to sexual maturity, while avoiding experiencing even a hint of intimacy? That had left him feeling dead inside. Females were bitches, though. Betrayers. He had learned that lesson, and he wasn't going to put himself through that again. Never. He couldn't control the urge to fuck, but he could control how it went down. And it went swift, hard, and without any intimate contact, just the way he liked it. A flash of Aya in the room at Archangel, her white strapless bra and panties stark against her creamy skin, and her entrancing eyes fixed on him, had him instantly hardening in his trousers. He palmed his rigid cock, cursing her name and his lack of control. He wouldn't get involved with her. Never. He couldn't trust her. She had proven that to him. She had set a trap for him, and he had fallen right into it. She had given him over to the people who had destroyed his life without hesitation, and he would make her pay for that. He gritted his teeth and pressed his palms against his knees, his fingers curling over and claws digging in. His eyes narrowed on Aya as she walked the main road of her neighborhood. She had played him, and now he would make her regret it. He would show her how wrong she had been about Archangel, and he wouldn't stop telling her all the gory details of his past, all the horror he had witnessed that night, until she broke down and showed him she regretted what she had done, just as he regretted his actions. If he had to live with his sins, then she had to live with hers. He might have accidentally placed her into the hands of Archangel twenty years ago by allowing one of their members to play him for a royal fucking idiot. But she had turned around and done the same to him, and she had known exactly what she had been doing when she had thrown him to the wolves. Kavanaugh's deep rumbling voice echoed around his mind. Harbin focused on it, allowing the words to soothe his darker side now just as they had when his brother had spoken them during a private talk back at Underworld. Kavanaugh had been kind to him since he had walked back into his life, treating him gently and with great care. But he had been firm about one thing, giving Aya a chance. It had taken some convincing to get Harbin to agree to that, his brother countering every point he tried to make, forcing him to look at it from the other side, her side. Kavanaugh had given him a lot to think about, and in the long, quiet day that had followed it, when he had been alone in his temporary quarters in the nightclub, Harbin had done just that. It had led him back to the feeling he'd had in the Archangel facility, the need to make Aya see the truth and free her from Archangel's clutches, breaking their hold on her mind. He sighed and watched her. Small, weak. She needed his protection, and as much as his darker side wanted to punish her for what she had done to him, he couldn't allow his bitterness to stop him from seeing her to safety. He couldn't allow himself to think of her actions as a betrayal. Archangel had deceived her. It had deceived him. He had to stop following her, watching her from a distance, and confront her. He had to face the fear that he might not be strong enough to control himself around her, unable to suppress his need to retaliate and lash out to protect himself, or kiss her again. Gods, he was messed up, still torn between punishing her and kissing her. He had hoped that in time those twin urges would fade to a manageable level, but they only seemed to be growing worse the longer he delayed talking with her. He tried hard to push away the feeling that she had betrayed him, but it was difficult. Whenever he managed to subdue it enough to head out to hunt for Aya, it came back again, rising inside him like a black tide, an oil slick that smothered the softer side of his heart that she had brought back to life. It pushed him to lash out at her filling his mind with poisonous thoughts, telling him that she had hurt him. She had. But God's, he had hurt her first. What the merry hell are you doing? The deep male voice coming from behind him had Harbin on his feet, and facing the owner in a flash, his claws at the ready and a growl leaving his lips. How the fuck had the male snuck up on him? He had been absorbed in watching Aya, but he had still been alert, aware of his surroundings. The only plausible answer was teleporting, but the male was mortal. I didn't hire you to stalk the female to death, the male said, 
his English accent bearing a regal edge that left Harbin aware of what this male thought of him. The bastard thought him lowly and disgusting, and that speaking with him or being in his presence was beneath him. Harbin bared his fangs on a snarl, concealing the intake of breath that he pulled over his teeth to catch the male's scent. A witch. No wonder the bastard had been able to sneak up on him. Harbin despised witches. He curled his lip at the wretch, feeling it was only fair he let the male see what he thought of him, since he had been so kind as to make his feelings about Harbin clear as day. The witch narrowed red eyes on him. Everything about this male was darkness incarnate, from his black trousers and the long black robe he wore over the top of them to his black hair, to the scent and sense of magic that bled from him. Well? It took Harbin a moment to recall that there had been a question, and when he did, he barely hid the shock that rippled through him. Aya hadn't hired the guild to kill her. This male had. He stared the male down, swiftly studying him and putting everything about him to memory. Why would a witch hire him to kill Aya? He took another deep breath and stilled. It was subtle, but hidden amongst the scent of death and magic was one that was all too familiar to him a scent that was branded on him and one he could never forget. The scent of the archangel huntress who had betrayed him. A growl rumbled up his throat, but he caught it in time, holding it inside, and schooled his features to hide the emotions running riot inside him. The male was allied with the bitch he had been searching for since that night twenty years ago. He was being played all over again. I'd love to kill her but I'm under strict orders to wait for my boss and a fellow assassin to get their arses here. Harbin folded his arms across his chest, positioning his fingers on his biceps in such a way that the male would see his claws were out and he was ready for a fight if he made a move. The witch's eyes narrowed into fiery slits. You require three males to kill one little female? Perhaps we have hired the wrong guild. We. Either there was more than one witch involved, or he was talking about the archangel huntress he was in league with. Harbin snorted. <laughs> My part of the job is purely tracking. Fury wants the kill, and I don't tend to deny Fury anything. He has a tendency to kill people for that sort of thing. The way the male's skin blanched told Harbin that he was aware of Fury, and knew the legends that surrounded him. Legends that were all true. The witch stared at him for long seconds, a calculating edge to his red gaze, and then nodded stiffly. Very well. He disappeared. Harbin's shoulders sagged and he looked back towards the place where Aya had been but was now gone. He didn't trust the witch. The bastard's eyes had slid towards where Aya had been walking just before he had nodded. Was he going to go after her? Was he on to him? Harbin was sure that he hadn't revealed his surprise to the male, or the anger that had washed through him on realizing who the male was working for and that he was being set up again, but what he didn't show on the surface could easily be detected by a spell. He stared at the spot on the street where Aya had been, focusing on her scent and drawing deep breaths of air down into his lungs to catch it again. She would be heading home now. Having passed the evening meandering around the late-night shops and some cafes that stayed open into the small hours, the Archangel Huntress had hired him to kill her. The thought of finally getting his hands on her and having his vengeance reawakened the colder, emotionless, and lethal part of himself that had been in command for the past twenty years, filling his mind with pleasing images of luring her to her death. The woman wanted him to kill Aya because she knew Aya was connected to him. He could use Aya to draw the woman and the witch out and eliminate them both in one fell swoop. His deeper primal instincts pushed back against that idea, focusing on what would happen to Aya if he walked down that dark path. The huntress must have known Aya back when she had been a captive of Archangel, and now she was using her to get to him. He couldn't use Aya in the same way. His every instinct demanded that he protect her and keep her close to him, and did nothing that might endanger her. She was his mate. It was imprinted on him, unshakable and undeniable, even when he wanted to pretend otherwise.
The instincts as her male ran deep in his blood and his bones, and he couldn't ignore them. They were stronger than the new instincts that had been born in the bloody aftermath of that night two decades ago. The ones he had honed until they were as sharp as the blades he favored as an elite assassin. More powerful than the ones that whispered this was a golden opportunity to put an end to the bitch who had haunted him for twenty years and finally lay his ghost to rest. He stood at the edge of the rooftop as a war waged inside him the two sides of him battling as he struggled to see the right path to take. Could he really allow this opportunity to pass him by? He had been waiting twenty years to face the Archangel Huntress, had searched for her across all the continents, following even the smallest breadcrumb in his desperation to redeem himself, and shed the weight of his sins from his shoulders. He growled and tore his eyes away from the direction of Aya's apartment fury curling through his veins and mingling with the guilt there. What kind of a sick son of a bitch was he? He knew Aya was his fated female, yet there was a part of him that was willing to risk her life in order to finally have his vengeance, sating the need that had been burning inside him for twenty long years and had kept him marching forwards through a dark existence, treading a path that could only do him harm towards a future that grew blacker the longer he kept walking it. He couldn't turn back, though. It was too late for that. He didn't care about saving himself from whatever harm life as an assassin was doing to him. He didn't care that it was killing him, stripping him of feeling and making him disconnect from the world he had once loved, leaving him feeling that he couldn't trust anyone, not even Hart. He only cared about avenging his family and his pride. He only cared about righting his wrongs, he only cared about protecting her. Once Aya was safe and the Huntress was dead, he would return to his life as an assassin and he would never see her again. A scream rent the night air, and Harbin's head snapped up, his gaze instantly zeroing in on the direction it had come from. A chill ran through him, and he was moving before he had even thought about what he was doing, driven to reach the source of that terrified shriek. Aya. He knew it in his blood as it thundered through his veins, felt it in his blackened soul as he leaped the gap between two buildings and sprinted across the flat roof. She was in trouble. He had to reach her. He palmed the pocket of his combat trousers as he dropped to the street close to her home, feeling the slender tube in it and the weight of what he had to do. She wasn't safe in London anymore. He had to take her away to a place where she would be protected. He hit the pavement and kicked off, launching himself forwards, towards two shadowy figures in the alley next to her apartment building. As they shifted to face him, he caught a glimpse of creamy skin and bright silver eyes beyond them, and snarled through his emerging fangs. He wouldn't let them hurt Aya. He hurled himself at the two males, tackling them both head on. The left one sidestepped, coming to stand under the single light in the alleyway. He looked like the male from the rooftop, but his eyes were eerily blue. Harbin didn't break his stride. It wouldn't be the first time he had dealt with copies. They were often mistaken for siblings, but Harbin's nose and experience told him that these ones weren't true twins. They were clones created by magic, and that meant the male he had met on the rooftop was pouring his power into the two sacks of flesh before him, weakening himself, making it easier for Harbin to kill him. He snarled and lashed out with his claws, raking them across the chest of the male on the right. The male cried out and staggered backwards, a horrified look crossing his face before it darkened and he launched himself at Harbin. Harbin ducked, coming beneath the fist the male swung at him and up behind him. He kicked the male in the back, sending him flying across the alleyway, colliding with the other copy. The two went down in a heap. Weak. The male was already withdrawing his power from them, strengthening himself. He was sacrificing the two. A pale blur shot past him, hitting the wall a few meters above Harbin's head, and then darted across the space between the buildings. Aya. She was nimble as she leaped from building to building in an effort to escape. She wouldn't be quick enough, though, not unless he did something to buy her time. The red-eyed male was already on the move, heading after her. Harbin slammed his fist into the first copy, knocking him out with a single blow, and swept his leg around as he turned to face the other one, bringing it high into the air. 
He drove the heel of his boot into the side of his head, sending him crashing back down to the ground. The male grunted and started to get up again. Harbin pulled the tube from his pocket, shoved a feathered dart into it, and blew hard. The male slapped a hand over his neck, his eyes rolled back in his head, and he slumped onto the tarmac. Damn. Harbin checked the pouch in his pocket and grimaced. Gods, he needed to be more careful. The dart he had grabbed in his panic was laced with the deadliest poison in hell, drawn from the blood of the hydras that lived deep in the devil's domain. If he had mistakenly used that one on Aya, it didn't bear thinking about. What the merry hell do you think you are doing? The witch's voice echoed around the dimly lit alley. Harbin glared at him. This is our fucking job, and I won't tolerate interference. Our guild doesn't take too kindly to people who hire us and then finish the job themselves. Unless you want to deal with one pissed-off dark elf, I suggest you back the fuck off and let us do our work. The witch's red eyes narrowed, but Harbin refused to back down. Instead, he shifted to face him, bracing his feet shoulder-width apart, his fingers twitching against the tube in his hand, and his thoughts on plucking another dart laced with hydrotoxin and shooting the bastard with it. The male glanced down at it and then back up at his face, locking gazes with him. Very well, but we expect a result within the time limit, or it will be your head rolling. Black smoke swirled around the witch, and when it dissipated, he was gone. Wretch. Harbin didn't trust him. It was a long shot, but hopefully he had done enough to cover his tracks, and the witch had bought what he had said and had actually left the area and wasn't watching from the shadows. He raised his head, silver eyes searching for Aya. He spotted her near the top of the building and nimbly used the same trick to reach it, leaping higher and faster than she had, his body more powerful than hers would ever be. He kicked off hard near the top and sailed over her head, coming to land in front of her. She stopped dead, her enormous eyes catching the moonlight, glowing with fear and with something else he didn't dare name. That something else grew stronger as she ran a glance over him and he gritted his teeth, willing his body not to respond to the heated look. She was his mate, but she would never be his, and the quicker he got that through his thick skull, the better it would be for both of them. It didn't matter how much he wanted her. Needed her. They could never be together. I killed one, but they'll be coming back for you, he growled and advanced a step towards her. Her cream satin slip fluttered in the cool breeze, luring his gaze down to her shapely legs. He resisted and kept his gaze locked with hers and his focus on his business with her. You're not safe here anymore. Her eyes widened further, and he felt the shock that rippled through her. It ran through him, too a warning sign that he couldn't ignore. Their paths were already entwining, their souls pulling together into a union he couldn't allow. He had to act fast for her sake, because being so close to her was stirring something dangerous inside him, awakening a feral need for her, one he wasn't sure he would be able to resist as it was now, let alone when it grew stronger as he knew it would. He had to get her to safety figure out his plan and get it done soon, or he was going to lose control and end up doing something they would both regret. I'm sorry, he whispered and she frowned at him. He chose the tranquilizer dart from the container in his pocket, slid it into the tube and brought it to his lips. He fixed his eyes on her neck and blew, and she flinched as the dart struck. Her legs buckled. Harbin couldn't stop himself from catching her, crossing the distance between them with a single leap to cushion her fall with his arms. He froze and stared down at her, breathing hard as the scent of her and her warmth curled around him, seeping into him, marking him. He pulled her closer to his chest and eyed the dart that protruded from her neck. She didn't even twitch as he gently pulled it from her flesh and discarded it. Blood blossomed where it had been, and he was lowering his head and pressing his lips to that spot before he could get the better of himself. Heat bloomed inside him as her blood coated his lips, flowing down into his chest and filling it with light. He shook as he breathed her in and tasted her, and gathered her even closer. It still wasn't enough. He needed more of her. Harbin lifted his head and stared down at her. 
The moon turned her skin white and perfect, and her silvery eyebrows and lashes sparkled in its gentle light. Gods, she was beautiful. But she could never be his. He would only taint her with the darkness living within him. As his mate, she deserved the best life that he could give to her, and that was the life he would give to her, a life without him in it. Chapter 14 His leather boots were loud on the polished black stone floor that reflected warm torchlight up at him, each step a heavy thud that echoed along the broad arched corridor of the main entrance of the guild. Harbin adjusted his grip on the female in his arms, cradling her closer to his body as he carried her into the heart of the place he now called home. Her head lolled, falling against his biceps, and he couldn't resist the urge to look down at her that stole through him. Her soft shell-pink lips parted, her warm breath fanning his skin as he held her nestled against him. In his arms, where she belonged. He erased that last thought as two assassins approached him neither of them from the guild. Sometimes the guilds teamed up when a particularly dangerous target with a high enough price on their head came along. What business had these two assassins been doing here? The blonde females were quick to notice his cargo, and even quicker to speak with each other in their native language, one he had never bothered to learn. Succubi made good assassins, but he preferred to keep away from their kind. They had a tendency to kill any male who sampled their wares. One giggled as he passed them, a snigger that made him want to turn and growl at her in warning. The rules of his guild were known by all in it, and even some from other guilds. They knew he was breaking them, and he was sure they were just itching to watch the calamity that was about to unfold when he reached the main reception room. He locked his senses on the pair, monitoring them, feeling them swaying between continuing out of the door and turning back to see Hart rip him a new one. The bitches turned back. Harbin huffed and kept trudging onwards, into the impressive black-walled reception room at the end of the corridor. Four of the guild's longest-serving demon members lounged in the horseshoe of black velvet couches that surrounded the monstrosity of a marble fireplace to his left, the satisfied smiles on their faces telling Harbin that the succubi had been here for pleasure, not business. The demons all looked at him the second he entered the room. One of the male's black horns curled through his thick, dark hair, so the points protruded past his cheeks, a sign of aggression. Harbin had considered he would have trouble with Hart when he brought Aya to the guild, but he hadn't considered that other members of the guild would have a problem with her presence. The male pushed onto his feet, coming to stand at least three inches taller than Harbin and twice as broad. If he fought, the three other demons with him would fight too. Harbin wasn't sure he would be able to protect Aya from them. The black door in the far right corner of the room shot open and Hart strode in, his violet eyes dark with the anger rolling off him in waves so intense that Harbin was sure everyone in the vicinity would sense the elf's fury. Hart's black clothing disappeared, replaced in an instant by his armor as it swept outwards from the black and silver bands around his wrist, the scales coming to cover him from toe to neck. They coursed over his hands, too, forming deadly jagged talons. Harbin tucked Aya closer to him and bared his fangs in warning. He didn't want to fight Hart, but the male was throwing vibes at him that had his primal instincts firing and demanding he protect his mate. What the hell do you think you're doing bringing her here? Hart snapped, ignoring his warning and stormed towards him. His pointed ears flared, poking through the unruly strands of his blue-black hair and his fangs showed between his lips as he talked. You were meant to kill her! Harbin roared at him. Hart's eyes widened and he stopped dead. The entire room dropped into stunned silence. Fuck, the reaction had shocked even him. It had been feral and powerful, overwhelming him and seizing control, hijacking his body and forcing the response from him when he had felt his mate was threatened. He breathed hard, fighting for control over his instincts, aware that he had just crossed a line and that if he wasn't careful, Hart would do more than shout at him. Hart would do more than fight him. This place was his home, his pride, and he couldn't allow anything to jeopardize his place in it. He had already lost one family. He couldn't lose this one, too. He needed the guild. It was his life now, 
and nothing would ever change that. You good now? Hart whispered softly, and Harbin nodded. Care to explain to me why you brought her here? That riled his snow leopard side, making it push for freedom. He needed to shift and show this male that he had no right to question him when it came to his mate. He had no right to look at her in that way, as if she was something to be eliminated or cast out into the dangerous world outside of the guild. He deepened his breathing, seeking some sliver of calm that he could hold on to. While he mastered his animal side and regained control of it, he could feel everyone staring at him, their gazes piercing him, judging him. He knew the rules. He knew he wasn't allowed to bring anyone from outside the guild into it with the intention they would stay longer than a few minutes. As long as it took to satisfy whatever urge had struck the assassin in question, or take a potential business partner away from the guild to a local bar to talk about a job. He knew no one had ever dared to break that rule since Hart had created it centuries ago. He just had nowhere else he could go. He looked down at Aya where she slumbered in his arms unaware of the danger that he had placed her in by bringing her to this dark place. It was danger that he could control, though. He hadn't had a choice. This was the safest place he knew. The witch could enter hell, but he wouldn't dare attack an entire guild of assassins. The contract is a trap, Harbin said, his tone flat and controlled despite the emotions that raged out of control inside him whipped into a frenzy by the memories of what had happened and the thought of Aya being in danger. He lifted his head and locked eyes with Hart, catching the male's surprise in their violet depths. It's her, the Huntress. Hart's eyes widened. You're sure? Harbin nodded. A male witch made himself known to me when I was tracking Aya. I recognized the Huntress's scent on him. They're in league with each other which means Aya was bait for me. Because she's part of your pride? Hart's steady gaze challenged him to admit that she was more than that to him, but he refused, unwilling to surrender that information when so many of the guild were present. What Aya was to him was personal, and he wasn't in the habit of sharing personal shit with other guild members. Personal information was another weapon they could use against him if they ever turned on him. I couldn't take her to Kavanaugh. I won't place him and the others there in danger. Harbin looked back down at Aya and bit back the sigh that tried to leave his lips as he studied her soft face, losing himself in her beauty all over again. You'd put us in danger, though, the dark-haired demon muttered. Hart whipped around to face the four males. If you're afraid of a little witch and his lackeys, perhaps you're in the wrong fucking profession. Take your whores and get out of my sight. The demon snapped his mouth closed and shuffled away, heading for the exit with his friends and the succubi. I should set fury on them for being whelps, Hart snarled as he watched them go and then sucked down a deep breath and switched his focus back to Harbin. The darkness in his boss's eyes remained, lingering like dangerous storm clouds. Cut the crap. She's more than just a former member of your pride. The Huntress has been in hiding for two decades. There's no damned way she would risk a showdown with you, unless she had an ace up her sleeve, and I'm guessing the female here is that ace. Hart's eyes narrowed, holding Harbin immobile and unable to escape what he could feel was coming. She's your fated one. Those words seemed to echo around the room forever, each stinging his heart and making him feel the dreaded weight of them. She was his mate, but that wasn't a good thing. I've been too close to her. The connection between us is already awakening, and that means it's strong. Harbin blew out his breath. If the Huntress harms her, I'll feel it. She'll use Aya to weaken me. Fuck, Hart grunted and dropped his eyes to Aya, and Harbin had to bite his tongue to stop himself from growling and demanding he take his gaze off his mate. Hell. He had thought that being on the cusp of sexual maturity had been a royal pain in the arse. It was a cakewalk compared with the urges that ran through him every second of every minute that he was close to Aya, a barrage of needs and desires that seemed at odds with each other, tearing him apart from the inside. Part of him wanted to give her the life she deserved, one without him tainting it, 
and the rest demanded that he stay with her. It screamed at him to protect her and claim her as his mate, so no other could have her. I take it you have a plan, Hart said, pulling him back to the room and away from dangerous thoughts of gouging his boss's eyes out so he couldn't look at Aya. Harbin really wanted to nod and say that he had, because he knew there was going to be a fuck-ton of disappointment in Hart's eyes when he told him the truth. The elf's expression shifted, and it seemed Harbin's hesitation was all the answer the male needed. Hart sighed and pinched the bridge of his nose. We can come up with something. For now, take her to your room and keep her there. I'll send out a mandate to the guild members that will protect her, but it's best she isn't left alone. Harbin couldn't agree more. He intended to stay by her side for the entire duration of her stay. He wouldn't let her out of his sight. He wouldn't risk her. He looked down at her again, his heart heavy as he realized that risking her might be his only option, his best shot at drawing out the witch and the huntress. Harbin turned away from his boss, heading to the back right corner of the room and the door to the east wing where his quarters were. He stared down at her the entire time, unable to take his eyes off her or shake the creeping sense that he had no choice this time either. If he wanted to have his vengeance, he would have to risk Aya. He would have to place his fated female in danger. It was the only way. Chapter 15 Spice and snow. It wrapped around her, warming her down to her soul and soothing the ache from her tired limbs. Aya rolled onto her side and curled into the thick blankets, pulling them around her and burrowing deep into them. The scent grew stronger, teasing her senses and making her yearn to see the male the pleasing smell belonged to, but she couldn't bring herself to open her eyes, not when she was so warm and comfortable. Her ears twitched as a distant bang sounded, rattling her from her dream. She fluttered her eyes open, but they were hazy, her vision blurred blending everything together into one somber mash of colors with a single golden glow in the center. When the room around her finally came into focus, she shot up in the bed and her eyes darted over everything from the lamp burning on the side table to the black walls and to the dark ebony dressing table and drawers opposite her near an equally obsidian door on the right side of the small room. A room that wasn't hers. Where was she? Aya tossed the dark crimson covers aside and leaped from the double bed, heading for the window cut into the thick stone wall to her left. She stopped dead when she reached it, her eyes widening as she stared at the dark world outside. She had the sinking feeling that she wasn't in London anymore. Black mountains rose in the distance, above crooked roofs tiled with dark gray slates. A gloomy sky filled the space above the town and the range of cragged peaks, nearly as black as them. Where the hell was she? Aya paused. Hell. Gods, it was all coming back to her now. Harbin had been there on the rooftop. He had saved her from the witches. He had drugged her. He had brought her to hell. Her stomach flipped and she shot to face the door when another bang sounded. Her heart pounded, thundering against her chest, and she threw a panicked glance around her at the room. It smelled of Harbin, but she could scent others, too, and she could sense many moving around the building. Assassins. She was in their home, and she had a price on her head, a contract that this guild was meant to fulfill. She was in danger here. Her every instinct roared her to run. She shoved at the sash window, but it didn't move. Her fingers shook as she fumbled with the lock, managed to get it open, and tried again. The window still refused to open. It was sealed shut. Her breath came quicker, panic setting deep roots in her as she looked across the room to the door that led outside. She had to risk it. She bolted for the door and had it open in a heartbeat. Her head swung both ways, eyes landing on a black wall to her left where the corridor ended and a long hallway that seemed to go on forever to her right, lit by wall lamps at intervals. She shoved off and was sprinting barefoot down the corridor a second later, her cream satin slip whipping around her thighs as she passed several corridors shooting off from the one she was running along. She swiftly bolted down one on her left when she sensed someone ahead of her and took the next right, which only led to another left and left again. A growl curled from her lips. The place was a damned maze. 
How the hell was she meant to find her way out of it? There had to be an exit somewhere. Another bang sounded behind her, sending a shiver down her spine, and she ran harder, taking a sharp right and then left when she hit the main corridor again. She sprinted at full pelt towards a door at the end of the black-walled corridor and slammed her palm into it as she reached it. It flew open and she stumbled into a large room lit by more lamps on the obsidian walls. Several pairs of eyes landed on her. Aya jerked to face them and her legs turned to noodles. Demons. The four males rose from the black couches surrounding a rather hideous fireplace directly opposite her their obsidian horns curling forwards as their eyes darkened. As each one stood, her legs weakened a little more. They were massive. All of them stood well over 6'6", six, six, and all of them were bare-chested and packed with muscle. She couldn't fight them. She wasn't strong enough to tackle one demon, let alone four. But what she lacked in strength, she made up for in agility. She could evade them and escape. A foul-smelling breeze was coming from an archway near the far left corner of the room. Freedom laid that way, and it would be hers. She just had to get past the four demons that were moving out from behind the couches now, coming to block her path. Aya focused on her body and willed the shift, urging it to come quickly this time. She kept her eyes locked on the biggest demon as it swept through her, gritting her teeth against the sharp, fierce pain as her bones distorted cracking and molding into new shapes. Her ears rounded as thick silver fur rippled over her skin and rose up the side of her head at the same time as her cheeks puffed outwards and her nose flattened. The demon muttered something to his friends and grinned. Her tail sprouted from the base of her spine and she landed on her four large paws and wrestled free of her slip to give herself the complete freedom to move as she needed. She lowered her head and snarled at the demon through her fangs. The room brightened as her vision sharpened, and she quickly took in each demon from head to toe, calculating her odds of escape and the best route to take in order to avoid conflict. The biggest demon advanced. Aya roared at him, but he didn't even flinch. He smirked. The door off to her right, bursting open, wiped that smirk off his face, capturing his focus and giving her an opportunity she wouldn't waste. She launched herself at him. A strong hand grabbed her by the scruff of her neck and jerked her backwards. Her breath left her in a rush as she was slammed into the black stone floor, and she immediately began struggling, snarling, and growling as she tried to wrestle free. Steady, Harbin murmured close to her ear, his warm breath tickling her fur and sending an all-too-pleasant shiver through her. He moved back as she did as he instructed going still and breathing slowly to calm her animal instincts to break free and fight to protect herself, and loosened his grip. When she made no move to attack the demon again, he released her and stood. Aya looked up at him where he towered over her, a vision of menace and lethal grace in his tight black clothing, his silver hair swept back from his face to reveal his icy eyes. They were locked on the demon, and his pupils slowly widened. He was hunting the male waiting for him to dare to make a move, his focus completely on the demon so he couldn't twitch without Harbin seeing it. I thought we made it clear you were to leave her alone, Harbin said, his tone flat and cold but holding a note of warning. He wanted to fight the males. They wisely backed off, each tossing a black look at Harbin as they went, heading towards the exit to her left. Suddenly, freedom didn't look so appealing. She didn't want to run into them again. Harbin stepped past her, watching them go. When they were out of sight, he turned towards her and hunkered down in front of her. You were meant to stay in my quarters. He huffed and she lowered her gaze, unable to ignore the deeply rooted behavior that had been branded on her during her upbringing. Harbin was an elite member of her pride, and she had been taught to never displease any belonging to his bloodline. It was difficult to overcome that instinct, even when she was in hell, in a guild of assassins, a place he called home and a profession he had chosen. He had overcome the instincts that had been branded on him, shaking the desire to seek peace over bloodshed. Why couldn't she do the same after everything that had happened to her? She edged her eyes back up to his face and found him watching her, his silver eyes softer now, giving her the answer to her question. She had overcome those instincts. She had shaken their hold. 
It wasn't her upbringing in the pride and the rules she had followed there making her want to avoid his steady but warm gaze. It was her new instincts, the ones that drummed in her blood and said that the male before her was her mate. Gods, she wished it had been her old instincts that had made her look away when she had seen the anger in his eyes, because she wasn't sure how to deal with the new ones. He reached for her and she snarled at him, warning him not to touch her. She couldn't bear it, not right now. Whenever she was near him, he stripped her of her defenses and left her weak. She felt too vulnerable, liable to do something reckless and stupid, like kissing him. She had been an idiot back then, believing that she could win the heart of a male of his status, and she had learned her lesson. She wouldn't be that stupid again. He stared at her a moment longer and then slowly rose to his feet. Come. Aya pushed onto her paws and followed him back through the corridors, her mind churning and heart aching, as she tried to figure out what she was going to do. It was clear that he expected her to remain in this place, and as much as she wanted to run away from him in order to purge the feelings growing inside her, the hungers that had her eyes lingering on the firm globes of his backside as he prowled the corridor ahead of her, she had no choice but to obey him. For now. She couldn't return home, not when the witches knew where she lived. She wasn't even sure she knew how to return home. She had heard tales of hell and legends about gates that could transport people to this realm from the mortal one, but she didn't have a clue whether those stories were real or where to find a gate and how to use it if they were. She had to bide her time until she had a plan, and then she would leave this place. Harbin held the door to his room for her and she padded past him, her paws silent on the stone floor. She felt his gaze tracking her, lingering and burning into her as he closed the door. The click of the latch sliding into place drove thoughts of running from him and her feelings from her mind and narrowed the world down to the small room. To him. He stood there behind her, silent and still, his eyes on her, and the urge that ran through her was dangerous and alluring, and no matter how much she fought it, it was too tempting to deny. Aya glanced into the small adjoining room to her left, a bathroom, the perfect place for shifting back and finding something to cover herself. She looked back over her shoulder at Harbin, her breath lodging in her throat as she caught the hunger in his glowing eyes, the same need that coursed through her veins and seized control of her. She closed her eyes and willed the shift. The sound of Harbin's breathing turning heavier filled the tense silence. As her bones lengthened, her tail shrank and her ears moved back down as her nose narrowed. The fur covering her body was the last thing to change, disappearing into her bare skin and leaving her standing before Harbin. Naked. She wrapped one arm across her breasts and covered her mound with her other hand as she turned her head towards him where he stood behind her, his intense gaze drifting over her body. Heat rippled through her in the wake of it, and she swallowed hard before slowly shifting to face him and opening her eyes. The hunger in his sent a stronger thrill through her. She had never felt sexy, knew she wasn't perfect or had the body the mortal world touted as one all females should aspire to have. She wasn't thin, but she wasn't ashamed of her figure. This was who she was. But while she was happy, she had never felt beautiful. But Harbin's silvery gaze, the heat that burned in it, made her feel sexy. It made her feel confident and desired as he crossed the room to her, those hungry eyes gliding down the length of her body and back up again. It made her feel beautiful. Even when she felt certain that she shouldn't fall under his dark spell. He was an assassin, not the male she had grown up with back at the village, crushing on him from the rear of the classroom. There was barely a trace of that male in him now. He was ruthless, dangerous, and always serious, the complete opposite to the wild youth who had always been laughing and seeking out fun. But gods, that only made him more alluring. The lethal aura that rolled off him, the air of a powerful male, added to his masculine beauty and spoke to her feminine instincts, weakening her resolve. Harbin stopped right in front of her, so close she could feel the heat of his body, and stared down into her eyes through ones that held barely leashed desire. Before reaching past her, she jumped when he settled a thin blue robe around her shoulders, draping it over her front and covering her. 
Aya didn't take her eyes away from his as she slipped her arms into the sleeves and drew it closed, tying the belt around her waist. His spoke to her, telling her how difficult it had been for him to resist touching her, choosing instead to cover her. It seemed she wasn't the only one struggling with her new instincts and her old desires. She had wanted him forty years ago, and she still wanted him now. She wanted to believe it was the same for him, even when she felt sure that she was only fooling herself, seeing what she wanted to see in his eyes. He backed off a step, drew down a deep breath, and looked away from her. His eyes roamed back to her barely a second later, dropping from her face to the robe, darkening with hunger again, need that coursed through her blood too. He flashed his fangs on a snarl and paced away from her, placing as much distance as possible between them in the small room. Perhaps she had pushed too hard, but she had wanted to see what he would do. She had wanted to make him reveal the feelings he hid from her, and had wanted to make him see what he had been missing out on all these years because of his actions back at the Pride. Just the thought of what he had done, and the pain he had caused her, tossed a pail of snow on the fire of her desire, killing the flames and allowing her to regain control of herself. She couldn't let her instincts and the attraction she had always felt towards him rule her now. She had to be strong. Aya glanced across at Harbin where he had propped himself against the wall, his hands jammed in the pockets of his black jeans and his left leg bent at the knee, the sole of his boot pressing against the black plaster. He stared down at the floor, strands of his wild silver hair caressing his brow, a troubled look on his handsome face. Gods curse him. He seemed even more handsome now. What happened? She touched the spot on her neck where she recalled feeling the dart sting her, and his lips caress her. Had that been real or had she imagined it? She stared at his mouth, trying to remember whether he really had kissed the spot on her neck. His sensual lips moved in mesmerizing ways as he spoke, pulling her firmly back under his spell. The night the pride was attacked by Archangel, the charge was led by a single huntress. She got information out of me and used it to locate the pride while it was vulnerable. I discovered last night that she has surfaced and is working with the witch who attacked you. Witches, she corrected automatically. There were three. He shook his head and finally looked across the room at her, his silver eyes bright and intense. One witch, but he has the power to make copies of himself. It's a dark art, lost to most witches, but I've come across it before. I'm guessing he's from the same clan as someone I crossed paths with a few years back on a mission. By crossed paths, she presumed he meant killed. You think he's working with her because of what you did? She had to put it out there because it was the first thought that had crossed her mind, and she knew it must have crossed his, too. He sighed and plowed his right hand through his hair. Without a doubt. It seems I can't stop pissing people off. He closed his eyes and tipped his head back, pressing it into the wall behind him. The huntress who used you, Aya started and trailed off, when he opened his eyes and fixed them on her, a flicker of hurt in his eyes that he quickly mastered and erased. She cleared her throat and soldiered on, determined to get some answers. I think I know her. When the research facility where I had been taken closed and Archangel changed hands, a huntress came to me and... She told you I had sold you out. Harbin interjected in a low voice, and she nodded. He growled, flashing fangs again. I didn't. I would never. I know that now. I know a lot of things I heard were lies. She hated Archangel for it, too. It had been bad enough that they had made her feel Harbin had handed her and the others over to them, but the fact that they had convinced her to act as a spy on their behalf, making her believe that she was helping maintain peace between all species, made her feel sick, and part of her hated herself, too. She had been weak, and they had used it against her, playing on it to make her do as they wanted. Harbin stared across the room at her. Why did you avoid me after we kissed? That unexpected question hit her with the force of a tidal wave, rocking her and leaving her spinning. 
He wasn't talking about the kiss at Archangel. He was talking about that first kiss they had shared close to 40 years ago. She wasn't the only one who wanted answers, and the steely look in Harbin's silver eyes said he wasn't going to stop asking that question until she confessed. You're the son of our pride's Alpha, she whispered to her feet, and then lifted her head and looked him in the eye, determined not to let him make her feel that she had done something wrong. She had been muddled, conflicted. I was afraid. I wasn't sure what was happening, but I knew you were our future Alpha. He snorted. Now I'm nobody. A ghost. An assassin. A killer. She didn't need him to remind her of that fact, not when it had played on her mind from the moment he had walked back into her life. It unsettled her that his announcing it didn't change the attraction she felt towards him. He was a killer by his own admission, but all she could see was Harbin standing before her. He shoved away from the wall. I never would have been Alpha, he spat out with so much venom that she tensed. Cav has that title, and it would have passed to his kids. I thought about approaching you later. She hated the way her voice shook as she confessed that, and the way Harbin stilled, his breathing softening, as if her words had soothed him. But she could feel the dangerous current of anger flowing under his calm surface, too, could sense it in the growing connection between them. Her words had served as both a balm and a poison, soothing yet hurting him. Why didn't you? His voice trembled the slightest amount, revealing the depth of his feelings to her. Not his feelings now, but those of forty years ago. Her behavior had hurt him, and the resulting action he had taken had ended up hurting her. Because you had grown up so aggressive, so egotistical, taking whatever female you wanted because they wouldn't deny you due to your position within the pride. She barely stopped herself from adding more, reigning in her own anger and reminding herself that it was ancient history now and nothing they did could change it. They had both made mistakes, and they had both paid for them. Were both still paying for them. Don't sugarcoat it, Harbin growled at her. Maybe if you hadn't ditched me, I might have grown up differently. That one cut her deep, and she turned her face away from him, whispering, Maybe. He huffed and started pacing, his boots loud on the cold stone floor, and his agitation flowing through her. After their kiss, she had avoided him just as he had said, trying to get her head and her heart straight, and find the courage to approach him again. By the time she had realized that she liked him as more than a friend, and that she should have thrown convention out of the window and seized him with both hands, he had already been chasing other females. She had been glad when he had finally started leaving the pride females alone, heading down into the nearest mortal town for days at a time. It had hurt her, but she'd had no claim to him, and a male of his status was allowed to do whatever he pleased. He hadn't owed her anything. She lifted her head and watched him pacing, his powerful body flexing with each fierce stride that carried him back and forth along the wall opposite her. He glanced at her from time to time, conflict reigning in his eyes and the feeling she could sense in him. If she confessed that she had been hurt too, would that please him? Did he want to hear that her fear of crossing the boundary that had separated them had only ended up causing her pain for twenty years, until the night of the attack on their pride? Gods, who was she fooling? It still hurt her now. But she couldn't judge him or hold the things he had done against him, because she hadn't exactly been a saint herself. She had slept with many males during her years in London, using them to satisfy her urges indulging in brief flings that had meant nothing, never allowing her partners to scratch the hardened surface of her heart and see what was beyond it. She had kept them all at a distance, using and losing them, acting just as Harbin had. No male had ever affected her in the way he did. Just being in the same room as him made it impossible to breathe, stirred fire in her veins and had her aching inside yearning for his touch or the soft sweep of his lips across her overheating skin. Did she affect him like this too? A voice deep in her heart whispered she hoped so. Why? Did she still want him as more than a friend? 
The fire burning in her chest said that she did, regardless of the things he had done. Things she had no clue about. She felt as if everything she had known the past twenty years had been a lie, and her one chance of straightening everything out so she could finally move on with her life was pacing like a caged animal in front of her, radiating tension and something else, something alluring that spoke to her instincts and made her want to step into his path so he would walk into her, his hard body pressing against hers and his heat seeping into her skin. She wanted him to kiss her again, as he had at Archangel, fiercely, hungrily, and as if he would die without her. She shoved that desire aside and focused instead on him, hearing his words ringing in her mind. An assassin, a killer. What happened to you? she whispered. Harbin looked across at her and paused mid-stride. His expression shifted, turning pensive, and he came to rest on his heels. He was quiet for so long that she feared he wouldn't answer, that he would leave her forever wondering about him. I never knew what happened to you, he murmured, and then sighed as he rubbed the back of his neck, closed his eyes, and hung his head. As soon as I came around, and I realized that the pride was in danger, I raced back there. I almost killed myself climbing the mountain. But I died when I reached the village. His jaw flexed as he gritted his teeth, and the pain that flowed into her through their connection stole her breath and had her moving a step towards him, filled with a powerful need to comfort him. I saw the carnage. Saw my mother and sister dead on the snow. And it was my fault. I cannot imagine what it had been like for you, for everyone, when Archangel had attacked. I only know how I felt then. I only remember the pain and the rage and the burning need that consumed me. He opened his eyes and looked at her through his lashes, his irises glowing bright silver. I don't remember much of what happened then. It's fragmented. I know I shifted and went after Archangel, and I slaughtered many of them, but others got away. I don't remember how I got back to the village, but I think Kavanaugh was there. Aya's heart went out to him. When cat shifters suffered a great loss, their primal side grew wild and feral, unable to handle the flood of powerful emotions. Harbins had taken control of him, his grief forcing him into his animal form and filling him with a need to hunt and kill the ones who had murdered his family and his kin. When he had lost track of the people who had attacked the pride, his instincts must have driven him back to his home to rest. My father exiled me, Aya. Hearing her name leaving his lips transported her back forty years, and for a moment she saw the youthful boy he had been then, smiling and laughing at her. A second later she saw him drenched in blood, his eyes cold and empty, nothing more than a heartless husk of a male. She shook away that image of him and focused on the male standing before her now. He had been through so much and something told her she had only seen the tip of the iceberg, and the path he had traveled after losing his place in the pride had been dark and terrible indeed. She had survived hell for three years at Archangel's hands, but at least her suffering had ended. Harbin still suffered now. It was there in his glowing eyes, his pain and fury still raw and powerful, still controlling his actions to a degree. He wouldn't stop suffering until he had wiped out every member of Archangel that had been present that night. And now he had the opportunity to do that. And she wanted in on it. She wanted the bitch who had used him and who had shoved her into a nightmare and then lied to her to pay for the things she had done, manipulating them both and changing the course of their lives for the worse. After my father made it clear I was no longer welcome at the Pride, I did the only thing I could. I drifted from country to country, hunting down the remaining members of the Archangel team that had attacked our kin. Harbin turned and sat down on the end of the double bed, a sigh leaving his lips as his backside hit the mattress and it dipped beneath his weight. I crossed paths with Hart when I was tracking a hunter from Archangel, 
and he'd been hired to take down the same target. Hart saw some fucked up potential in me or something, because he convinced me to join the ranks of his guild. I could continue to hunt Archangel while taking care of other targets too, and earning some money to support my vendetta. Aya walked to the wall and leaned against it, standing close to Harbin where he sat on the bed opposite her. He lifted his head and looked up at her. She knew what potential Hart had seen in Harbin, because she could see it in him too, and it hadn't been forged in the fires of his time as an assassin. It had been born that night twenty years ago. Hart had known a killer when he had seen one, a male capable of taking lives without regretting his actions or the blood on his hands. Harbin had already killed many, had developed a hunger for tracking and eliminating targets. Hart's work to turn Harbin into an assassin had probably been minimal. All he'd had to do was tap into the hunger that still burned like ice in Harbin's eyes, the desire for bloodshed and death. A desire that should have made her want to keep her distance from him, but only made her want to take Harbin into her arms and hold him. She wanted to take his pain away and show him that it was all right, that he had done the right thing, and his fight was coming to a close now. They would end this, and both of them would be free of their pasts at last. I didn't take much convincing. Harbin smiled, but there was no warmth in it or his silver eyes. Hart told me he was short on assassins, the number in the guild diminished by a war between two demon realms and promised to share all information on Archangel that he received, and any mission that involved them. He leaned back, bracing his weight on his palms, and his torso tensed beneath his tight black t-shirt. It was a struggle to keep her eyes off his body and on his face, but somehow she managed it. I should have kept on with my mission. His expression turned deadly serious again, the feelings flowing through her shifting to match it, becoming cold and calm. She wished she could lock down her feelings as he could. It would have made standing so close to him easier on her, because she would have been able to shut down the desire that told her to cross the short span of floor to him, lower her hands to capture his cheeks and kiss him. Something flickered in his eyes, his silvery brows briefly twitching into a frown as he looked up at her, and she quickly pushed away from thoughts of kissing him aware that the ability to sense emotions ran both ways, and he was picking up on the sudden spike in hers. He shook his head. I shouldn't have allowed the jobs that came to me through the guild to distract me from my hunt for the Huntress. A soft sigh left his lips, conveying so much regret and guilt that she pushed away from the wall and barely leashed her need to hold him. I'm sorry, Aya. If I hadn't lost my way, if I had stayed on course and kept my focus, you never would have been dragged into danger again. She raised her hands and pressed them to her chest as it warmed, heated by his tender words. They touched her, but part of her was glad that he had been sidetracked and had lost his way, because it had brought them to this point. It had brought her to the start of a new path, a new life where she knew the truth and felt able to finally lay her past to rest and walk forwards into a brighter future. It had brought them together again. Aya stepped towards him and his eyes locked with hers, slowly widening as she closed the gap between them. They were both different now. She was no longer the meek girl who had been afraid to seize what she wanted with both hands, and she was going to show him that. She was going to take what she wanted without any regrets. She was going to have Harbin, even when it couldn't be forever. Chapter 16 Harbin tensed the moment Aya cupped his sculpted cheeks and edged backwards, attempting to evade her. She didn't let him get far, and his plan backfired, forcing her to move closer to him in order to keep hold of him. She nestled between his spread thighs, their knees touching, and he inhaled hard his wide eyes speaking to her of the uncertainty she could feel rippling through him. It reminded her of that day so many years ago when she had grabbed him and kissed him. She had expected it then, but she hadn't expected it now, when he had years of experience under his belt, and had been looking at her as if he wanted to kiss her more times than she could count since their paths had crossed. 
He swallowed and shook his head, his voice a mere whisper of warning. I uh, don't. She knew his fear, knew that she was pushing him too hard and was walking on thin ice, but she didn't care. She had spent forty years wondering what it would have been like to be with him, and now she had the opportunity to find out. She had to take this chance while she could. In a matter of days, the reason they had come together might be over, and then they would have to part ways again. She might never see him again. She wasn't going to fool herself into thinking this could be anything other than a brief fling. She knew in her heart that he would never want to mate with her. When he had spoken of Kavanaugh having children, there had been a glimmer in his eyes, one that said he had considered such a future for himself. That was a future she couldn't give to him. All she could do was seize this moment. It was all she could have with him, and although it might end up hurting her, she needed to take it. She needed to know what it felt like to be with him. She wasn't afraid anymore. Aya leaned over him, lowered her head, and pressed her lips against his. He responded instantly, his mouth claiming hers in a kiss so fierce that heat blasted through her and she moaned. He pushed forwards, his lips clashing hard with hers, and tongue-seeking entrance that she granted in a heartbeat, her own tongue tingling as they touched. He groaned and grabbed her hips, his fingertips pressing in, anchoring her in place in a way that thrilled her. This was what she wanted, this passion and intensity, this need. She wanted to feel desired by him, needed by him. He tugged her against him and she went willingly, her hands leaving his cheeks so she could brace herself on the mattress when she ended up on top of him. The violent shove away from him tore the air from her lungs, and it left her in a gasp as she found herself standing before him. His dark silver eyes flashed dangerously as he growled and locked his arms, keeping her at a distance and her heart stung as the shock of his rejection swept through her. I can't, he breathed and shook his head, ice raining in his eyes, turning them colder than she had ever seen them. She curled her hands into fists at her sides to stop them from shaking, and lowered her head, unable to look at him as she battled the hurt blooming inside her. She sucked down a deep breath as her feelings settled, and bravely lifted her gaze to meet his. Do you have someone else? His eyes widened again, a flicker of confusion crossing his face. No, it's not that. I just can't do this. Aya broke away from him, anger flaring hot in her veins as her mind hurled reasons at her, every one of them striking her heart. I get it. I do. You'll fuck every female who so much as glances at you, but not me. You can't do this with me. What was that pretty speech for earlier? To make me feel better? Are you lying to me now too, Harbin? I don't need people feeding me bullshit to make me feel better. Just say it straight. You never wanted me. That kiss meant nothing. Harbin's face darkened, and he pushed onto his feet, coming to tower over her. She glared up at him, refusing to let him intimidate her. I don't fuck every female who glances at me, he growled. Aya huffed and planted her hands on her hips. That's all you have to say? No, he snapped and grabbed her shoulders, his grip so tight it hurt. His eyes brightened, molten silver that warned she was pushing him again. It isn't that I don't want you, Aya. I wanted you all those years ago. I want you now. She cursed her heart for doing a ridiculous flip in her chest and knocked his hands off her. So what is it then? He sighed and reached out to touch her face, but she stepped back, evading him. He lowered his hand to his side, his jaw clenched as he gritted his teeth, and his nostrils flared as he drew in another deep breath. His silver eyes held her immobile. It's too dangerous. Before she could say a word, he grabbed her arm, pulled her close to him, and shoved her right palm against his chest. Gods, he was as solid as a rock beneath her hand his heart thundering against it. You can feel it, can't you? He whispered, his eyes locked on her face, imploring her to answer that question. The beat of his heart was too fast, too hard, too wild. He was barely in control, and she had only kissed him. I'm on the cusp, Aya. 
and the hungers you bring out in me are too strong. I might not be able to. I don't think I can keep control. He flashed his fangs on a growl and clutched her hand, his short claws pressing in. What you're asking of me? I can't. It's too dangerous. Aya stared at his hand, strong and beautiful, holding hers so tightly against his chest. Her heart beat in unison with his, a mad rush that turned her blood to liquid fire, and made her burn to feel that hand on her body, satisfying the need that had been slowly consuming her from the moment he had kissed her in Archangel's facility. I know it's dangerous, she whispered and slowly lifted her chin, bringing her eyes up to meet his. I'm not asking you to retain control, Harbin, because I'm not sure either of us can. He snarled and swooped on her lips, his hands grasping her backside and hauling her up against him as he kissed her hard. Gods, this was what she needed to feel, this hunger, this need. It poured through him into her, stoking her own need. She clutched his shoulders, moaning as she felt his muscles flex beneath her palms. His feral growl as he turned and pinned her to the wall sent a cascade of shivers down her spine, and had her pulling him closer, needing to feel him against her. She looped her arms around his neck and lifted her legs, locking them around his waist. He groaned and pressed against her, the hard bulge between his thighs rubbing her in just the right spot. A moan slipped from her lips. She angled her head and kissed him deeper, tangling her tongue with his and seeking to master him. He fought back, his fierce kiss melting her bones and leaving her at his mercy. She needed more. He gave it to her, using his body to pin her in place as he tore her robe open with one hand. She gasped as his cool hand cupped her right breast, squeezing and palming it, stirring the heat in her veins into an inferno. She rubbed against him, aching to feel him against her, naked. She wanted to be flesh to flesh with him. Aya released his shoulders, grabbed the hem of his t-shirt, and yanked it up. He inched back, keeping his hips pressed hard against hers, but giving her a view she would never forget as he helped her, tugging his t-shirt off over his head, revealing delicious compact muscles to her eyes. Hell, she wanted to run her lips over every powerful inch of his body. She wanted to kiss every scar from the thickest ones on his left pectoral and above the ridge of muscle that ran over his right hip to the tiny silvery ones that were barely noticeable on his creamy skin. The need to feel his mouth on hers again overshadowed those hungers, and she dragged him back against her. He took the hint and kissed her again, so hard that the back of her skull ached where it pressed against the wall. He strummed her nipple with one hand, the other cupping her backside. Maddening. She growled into his mouth, earning a low moan as her reward, and raking her nails down his sides, delighting in the firmness of his body beneath her wandering hands. She stroked her thumbs over his hips, the ridges of muscle there sending a hot thrill through her. His body was so hard against hers, the sense of power that ran from him into her, cranking up her arousal until she was throbbing with need. She needed him. She needed her mail. Harbin, she uttered, the sound of her voice dripping with that need shocking her. He growled in response and dropped her to her feet. She could only stare as he pulled his belt open and popped the buttons on his fly and pushed his black jeans down his lean hips. Her breath hitched, desire pulsing through her as he revealed his cock. Her groin throbbed, wet with her need, and she moaned in bitter lip. God, she needed him. She reached a shaky hand out, wanting to touch the rigid steel length that rose from a nest of silver curls, and stroke the shaft before teasing the soft dark tip. Can't take that, he muttered and grabbed her again, grasping her hips and shoving her up the wall. Next time. She nodded. Next time. The tiny sensible part of her mind that remained reminded her that there wasn't meant to be a next time. Harbin drowned it out by pulling her legs around his waist and entering her in one delicious hard thrust. Aya cried out, and he captured her lips and drove deeper into her, until their bodies were pressed against each other and she couldn't take any more of him. She stilled with him, 
savoring the feel of him inside her, sensing he was doing the same. His kiss softened, slowing and warming her, filling her with light inside. Dangerous light. She couldn't let this become anything other than getting her taste of him, discovering what it was like to be with him. She couldn't. It was too dangerous. He feared his primal need of her was dangerous. She feared the same thing about hers. She feared it would make her fall for him all over again, and he would break her heart again, too. She deepened the kiss and rocked against him, trying to shatter the softness of the moment and drive him into losing control again, surrendering to his carnal desires. He growled and grasped her hips as he withdrew, his cock almost leaving her before he drove back inside. She moaned in time with him as he thrust into her, each long stroke of his length cranking her knee up to startling new heights. He nipped her lower lip and then pressed his forehead against hers, his breath hot on her face as he pumped her harder, his hips flexing deliciously beneath her hands as she latched onto them. Heaven! Heat and tingle swept through her with each meeting of their hips, growing more intense as his thrust grew fiercer. She moaned and tipped her head back, pressing it into the wall as she clung to him, feeling every intense plunge of his cock into her, feeling him laying claim to her body. She was ruined. She knew it. No male would ever be a match for Harbin. No one would ever surpass him. She had never felt anything like this. It was mind-blowing. Incredible. The soul-deep connection between them blossomed as Harbin dipped his head and kissed her neck, devouring it with soft nips of his blunt teeth, licking and teasing her until she quivered with need that only he could sate. She tightened her legs around him and grabbed his right shoulder with one hand and the back of his head with the other, tunneling her fingers into his hair. Gods, she moaned white lights dancing in front of her closed eyes as pleasure rolled through her, flowing from the spot where his lips touched her and mingling with the bliss already building in her belly, edging closer to detonation. Her mind whispered of the danger of allowing him at her neck, but she couldn't hear anything above the rush in her ears and her thundering heartbeat. He snarled and thrust harder, his claws digging into her hips, pinning her at his mercy as he took her, claimed her. She could sense it building within him, her instincts blaring a warning that she didn't have the strength to heed. The hunger building within her, the need for release, was too powerful, consuming her. She wanted more. Harbin, she whispered, and he growled against her throat in response and dipped his hips, angling them as he pumped faster, his powerful body flexing hard against hers. His pelvic bone slammed against her sensitive nub, and she cried out as the pleasure bomb that had been building inside her detonated, sending a shock wave through her that stole her breath and left her shaking from head to toe. She moaned with each delicious aftershock that blasted through her, sweeping upwards in the wake of every hard, rough thrust of his cock. He clutched her tighter, might have muttered her name into her throat, and nipped at her flesh again sending a sharp wave of tingles rushing through her. Aya started to shift her head to one side, desperate to feel his tongue on the nape of her neck and the sweet press of his fangs. He inched closer and then snarled and grunted, his actions turning jerky as his cock throbbed and she felt his hot seed shooting into her. He sharply pulled back and pressed his forehead to hers, his hips thrusting slowly as his release swept through him. The feel of his cock pulsing sent more ripples of pleasure through her, and she moaned in time with him. As she slowly came down from her high, realization dawned on her, cooling the blood rushing through her veins. Harbin was tense beneath her hands, his feelings in disarray. He pulled free of her, set her down, and tugged his jeans back up, and buttoned them as he paced away from her, heading towards the bathroom to her left. Without so much as a backward glance at her, he slammed the door closed and she flinched as the loud bang echoed around the silent room. Aya sank against the wall, her legs trembling, as shaken as he was. She touched the spot on the back of her neck, the place where she had tried to tempt him into biting, into claiming her as his mate. He had been right. It had been too dangerous.